two, one. Okay. Hey, Peter, how are you doing? All right. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How's your morning going? Uh, okay. Um, you know, we had some, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, moving parts in our in our life at the moment because my youngest son's getting married in the oh. midst of a of a COVID crisis, you know, and <laughs> and uh, my uh, house uh, I have um, a, a, a home out at the beach and we had a fire in that house and so now we're having to go through all of that and so that's been a uh, you know look I mean cry me a river, right? I have a house at the beach and I'm a, <laughs> I have a full-time job and all this stuff like that. So, you know, I'm not, I'm very fortunate, but it's, it's, it's just this whole, there's a lot of uncertainty, you know, in my yeah. life at the moment, which I normally as a college professor don't have, you know, this, <laughs> you know, the big thing I did before, uh, you know, visiting with you today was I took the test on for George Mason about how I can safely return to, to, uh, you know, campus, uh, you know, uh, because all of us have to follow these public health protocols and everything before we can go back once yeah. they open up in August 8th, I guess, is when the offices will be open. And so I took that today, which was a half an hour of my time, you know, basically learning everything that Dr. Fauci has said since March, you know, about how to return to campus. So, yeah. So, uh, if you see me on campus in the fall, I'll have a mask on and and uh, hand sanitizer, washing my hands all the time. So, so what did that go? What did that test consist of? It's just information telling us. It's not like they, uh, you know, uh, it's not a mandatory. It's obviously virtual right now, right? So they're just telling us all the information about what we need to do to be able to have physical distancing. You know, it, it, look, again, like I said, you know, it's everything that you've heard already. They're just yeah. saying it again for the college context. But, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, Mason is open, you know, for the semester. It's a hybrid model, both online and, and uh, uh, in person, but in person only in very small groups and with six feet apart between everyone. And so it's not the same college experience you had, but it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, we'll see how colleges do uh, and how they adapt and adjust to whatever the new reality is on all this, because, you know, there's no guarantee that there's gonna be a vaccine, right? I mean, yeah. and so the question is, is how do you adapt and adjust? And, and right now we're pursuing one kind of model and, you know, we'll see how long that one lasts. And, you know, these are, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things going on. It was like a very bad, perfect storm because you had a public health crisis in the middle of a uh, presidential campaign. <laughs> and so it's, it's, uh, it's hard to, I love this, it's a great um, video with Denzel Washington, where he's asked a question about the media. And he says, look, the current situation is, is that if you don't, you know, read, you are uninformed. But if you do read, you are misinformed. <laughs> and, and so then the person says, so, well, what are you supposed to do? And he looks at him and says, like, you know, back to the, the person. Well, that means basically it's up to you to adjudicate between all the different <laughs> information and make up your mind for yourself because you can't rely on just one source of information. And that's a big burden. And most people don't want that burden, you know, but yeah. uh, I think this, this has highlighted that a lot for us. Yeah. No, I completely agree with you. There's so much with the internet now at the tip of our fingers. And there's too much content, in my opinion, where it's overwhelming as a young person, and you have to decipher what is good content and what is bad content. And when I say good and bad content, I think of the internet and the information on the internet like fast food. There's, yeah. there's bad fast food, and then there's not necessarily bad fast food, right. there's better fast food. And there's a lot of ways where you can get a lot of anxiety or, um, bad information from the internet but then you can also go to crevices of the internet and find really good helpful information yeah i think that that's that's a very wise insight from you uh <laughs> the difference between information and knowledge yeah and uh and and if college is supposed to do anything it's supposed to equip citizens 
with a ability to critically sort between the vast amount of information to like the nuggets of knowledge that exists. And it's unclear that college is doing that job at the moment. Um, but, you know, that's the challenge to us professors to do a better job of doing it. And we need to do it ourselves because we're just as prone as anyone else to like, you know, uh, echo chambers and all of that kind of stuff like that. So it's a big issue uh, to, you know, I'm a, I've become more and more dedicated to this idea, not that I can live up to it, but Daniel Dennett, this philosopher that uh, teaches at Tufts, he uh, developed a, uh, a set of rules for argument and engagement with intellectual adversaries. And I think it, 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 any one of your listeners should look it up and just, it's called Dennett's Rules of Intellectual Engagement. And I think it does a tremendous job of making us question ourselves while listening to others, while maybe disagreeing with others. But, you know, always doing it with like a critical examination of, our, of ourselves and thinking constantly about what argument or evidence would persuade me to the opposite so that I filter, not just uh, cherry pick the information that fits with my existing comfort zone, you know? And so it's interesting. I, you know, the, the COVID thing has thrown me for a whole loop. Uh, but ever since 2016, uh, you know, a lot of things have thrown me for a loop. So I, I constantly am trying to find different media sources. So at one time I decided I wasn't gonna listen to any American sources, but just listen to foreign sources of how foreigners are looking at us. But I'm a sports junkie. And the problem is the one sport I don't like at all is soccer. <laughs> so if you listen to the world news anywhere else, all they all report soccer. on is soccer all the time. So I'm like, ah, you know, I got to go back to listening to these other things. But it's, uh, uh, I do think it's important to try to look through uh, different windows. Yeah. And, and that's like important. And that's why I think, you know, it's so valuable, like what you're trying to do with this to have these conversations. I saw Oprah just started a new thing, which is long form, uncomfortable conversations that she wants to have. Oh, really? um, I watched Bill Maher last night. And he had some people on talking about the, the, the difficulties of the cancer culture kind of uh, uh, idea or norm that's affecting so much of the media. It was in relationship to that Harper's letter that was done. And what Bill Harper's Mar letter? So Harper, a bunch of people from, uh, Sim uh, some from uh, Salman Rushdie to, uh, you know, uh, J.K. Rollins to, you know, Noam Chomsky, all these different types of people saw, saw, uh, signed this letter to Harper's bizarre about the need for us to have uh, free intellectual discourse in an age when everyone is just trying to shut other people up. And, uh, and I don't agree with everything that those people say, but I agree in principle with the John Stuart Mill idea that you need to actually have free discussion and debate about ideas to be able to bring uh, you know, light to the wrong ideas and things like that. And that we are in danger of losing that because everyone has politicized everything, you know? Yeah, I and, see that. Yeah. I see that a lot in my work where I'm a little nervous to say anything because I notice with a very large population of the younger generation, they jump to conclusions immediately as you say something. They don't actually listen to the full meaning of what you're saying or your intention they hear yeah. one key word and they just jump on it I'm like what yeah. did you just say why did you just say that and then all of a sudden you as a speaker feel like you're saying something wrong when you're really not and your intentions could be just to have a conversation about a sensitive topic so i yeah. think there's a lot of sensitivity right now yeah, um, yeah i i mean look i think there should be some sensitivity about you know, look, I mean, I, I'm, I'm uh, very much a, um, a very uh, committed liberal, um, and I believe that the great benefit of liberalism was that 
it is an emancipation doctrine that delivered individuals from the oppression by subjugation to authorities, kings and whatnot. And it, it uh, delivered us from the dogma of the church uh, and, and that. And it delivered us from crushing poverty of the plow and the violence of the sword. And, but none of those deliveries have ever been completely complete, right? And so there's, there's revolutions yet to happen to actually generate the, the outcome of a product of equality and dignity granted to all. And there are these injustices that need addressing. And, but in order for us to address them effectively, we have to have open conversations about all kinds of things. And so it's when you get to a situation where people think there's only one way to address it. And it turns out ironically that that one way happens to often be the way that's most comfortable to a lot of people who are in positions of power, <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> right then you're back to the very thing that liberalism was supposed to emancipate you from it yeah. just you know and so i think it's a very uh you know it's very important for us to have uh these conversations as oprah puts it which are uncomfortable and uh but you can only have them if you don't have the repercussions that uh you know if you say the uh, opinion that's wrong from somebody else but you know at the moment there's something very important too about the need for the dominant uh, group to listen to the people who have been oppressed so and I understand that issue so you don't have to have an answer right away for everything you have to listen and see what it is that people are finding as the 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 difficult parts that's part of the, diff the uncomfortable conversation too, is, you know, learning to listen. So I'm an economist and, you know, I think there's all kinds of issues associated with what's wrong with the economics profession, which has become a kind of a topic du jour in the, in the media and everything these days, right? And part of it is that, you know, it, it might have what's called a toxic culture uh, that people have complained about. Um, but there's also other reasons that are going in. One of them is also, it might be toxic, not only about, you know, certain uh, treatment of minorities and, and women or uh, sexual orientation, but also uh, different methodological perspectives, different ideological perspectives. I mean, it's a, it's a discipline which has very strong sorting mechanisms that are built into it and uh, compared to a lot of other disciplines. And those sorting mechanisms serve a certain uh, function of not being, uh, not allowing, you know, certain margins of ideas to be pushed because they would violate, like if you, violate, if you don't believe in scarcity or, you know, things like that. And so you get discipline for those views. And so in order to do that, they build in these strong sorting mechanisms to try to force people to bound their conversation with logic and evidence, but it does oftentimes stultify thought because it doesn't allow people with different sets of eyeglasses at looking at the implications of the fact that we live in a world of scarcity or the implications of a different empirical take on something. And we commit sins of omission all over the place. And then in order to have those fixed, we need to raise questions which some people might, might not want to answer. And so I think that's what, you know, I'd love to see that conversation going on about economics as well as the one about economics having an aggressive, uh, you know, seminar culture, right? <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Can you talk about that, the aggressive seminar culture? Well, I mean, I think that, that, that economics in the 20th century uh, you know, became dominated by formalism and empiricism. And those are tools of sorting. So unless you put things in a model with very, you know, definitive outcomes, and unless you test it with sophisticated statistical techniques. And so the seminar cultures that arose up that all became part of pecking holes 
in your model or showing that your empirical result, you know, had the problem of not dealing with the dreaded third thing, you know, like mm -hmm. where yeah. you thought was causation was really just correlation. It could be a spurious correlation. And so you were making errors or whatever. And so the seminar culture evolved to try to peck at those things as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And so that's just the way economists were trained for you know, 50, 60 years. I mean, if you go back to the 19th century, that's not the way we engage with one another. We might have engaged more violently with one another. What I mean by that is, you know, they wrote books. And if you want to hear like an economist attacking another economist in very unkind ways, read Marx, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? He, you know, he's attacking other economists. And then you read the, the bourgeois economists responding to Marx and they're like the same way. I mean, it's like, you know, the, 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 they, they, they get very nasty to one another. So they're not all like Adam Smith, you know, where they're these nice, kindly, English gentlemen or whatever, right? They're, they're yeah. smashing each other or whatever. But in the 20th century, as the science of economics matured and it, and it coalesced in universities, the debates took place in the seminar rooms outside of the, so we were kinder and gentler in the journals, you know, when we wrote to one another about what we were doing. But when our, our aggressive tone took place in the, and, and it was to try to find error and root out error. And so the presumption was, is that whatever's being presented before me is, is rife with errors. So I need to tear it apart. Mm -hmm. And if the person survives it, well, then now I've rooted out the error and they've survived. And so only the best, you know, survive. Oh, exactly. yeah. And so that culture sort of took place over economics. And, you know, certain people were masters of it. And they came to dominate the economics profession. You know, Milton Friedman was an amazing debater. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, the, you know, the folklore was is that Milton Friedman never lost a debate, though no mm -hmm. one would ever agree with what he actually said. But <laughs> in, and, and I, you know, I only met Milton Friedman when he was an old man, but I saw him debate people and he was phenomenal. I mean, he just he just didn't lose. You know, Gary Becker was amazingly quick. You know, in our universe, Gordon Tullock was amazingly quick. I mean, he one time turned to me in a seminar and asked me what I thought about something. And I said, Gordon, I'm not that quick on my feet. And he said, you should sit down then. <laughs> I was already sitting down, so it didn't make sense. But, but it was, it's like the way, he, how quick he was. I mean, I never would have thought of that until he said it. But yeah. it was like a very quick response and clever. And that's how, you know, and my colleague Pete Leeson is like that. He's an amazingly clever and quick-witted person. And, you know, he's also very quick to the cut so do you yeah. think to be like a great economist you have to have that charisma and that ability to be able to debate along with the intellectual skills of being able to do the analysis being able to understand yeah. what's going on you have to have those soft skills for lack of better words yeah it's uh it, you know it depends on the context you know right i mean so uh in the in the context previous to this current self-reflection on the discipline of course you know being clever was more valuable than being correct in a lot of ways <laughs> and if you think about some of our you know colleagues you know uh at mason uh you know one of the things about them is besides being uh very um intelligent people and and careful analysts they're also exceedingly clever i mean kaplan brian kaplan is a, an amazingly clever person uh he's so clever in fact that his last book that he did he was able to do in a graphic novel form you know because he's an innovator he thinks in terms of you know different ways to communicate information um it's a, it's a defense of open borders so he takes on a position that a lot of people have serious doubts about he takes on all the criticisms in an intellectually responsible way and tries to demonstrate that the critics are wrong that if once you look at the data and everything like that that it goes the other way but he does it in this form of this graphic novel you know and awesome. and so it's like this kind of weird juxtaposition of very serious economics but communicate it with like Brian Kaplan looking like a superhero in some of the, you know, some of the, some of the photos, you know, and so it's kind of interesting. Pete Leeson, you know, did a book, uh, this, this book WTF, 
which uh, examines a lot of weird practices in human history, things that we look at on, on the face of it, we're like, well, as he says, WTF, like, well, why the <laughs> hell would that be going on? And Pete then tries to explain their logical consistency and, and uh, their functional significance, given the constraints that the actors engaged in uh, that action were, were facing. And, you know, and so that's, again, very clever. And so you got, you know, he's very clever and very astute in using the tools of economic reasoning. You know, so you got Kaplan, you got, you know, Leeson doing that. And then at the same time, you got someone like Chris Coyne, you know, or Virgil Storr, both of whom published recent books that are on very serious topics, which are somber and cold analysis of very serious pro uh, 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 problems, but then have huge implications for the way we would understand how the world works. So COIN focuses on defense economics and, you know, what's gone on in our efforts to engage in basically military intervention since 9-11. And most recent one is on the domestic snapback. It's what's called tyranny comes home. And it's about this boomerang effect that happens, you know, whereas People go over and fight wars, they become desensitized, and they come back home. What kind of careers do they go into, and how do they practice that? It's part of the, not the only, but part of the explanation about the militarization of police. And, you know, Storr has a book where he's asking the question, do markets corrupt our morals? You know, which is a debate that everyone has. Oh, the free market corrupts our moral behavior. And what he does is he looks at all these different measures of, you know, morality and then shows, you know, how it is that markets actually civilize us rather than cause us to be more uh, immoral towards one another. And so I think those are examples of books that are tackling really, really important questions in a very careful and judicious manner. And cleverness is not the priority, but it, but what happens is it shows the power of economics to address really difficult problems. Uh, whereas the, the other ones show how wildly entertaining and valuable economics is as a window onto the world to address our history as well as contemporary policy uh, disputes that go on. Like for example, something so as important as the ability of individuals to freely move with them with their bodies and and choice of where they want to live and where they want to raise their families and and all of that and so you know and i haven't even mentioned tyler cowan which is kind of a combination of all of those things right yeah. um and in a new medium he and tabarack you know i mean think about it you know they were arguing over a decade ago that we needed to be ready to move to this online platform in economic education. Yep. And, you know, and lo and behold, here we are. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's so, yeah, I know that I just gave you a really long winded answer, but I want to tell you a funny story. When Tyler started blogging and marginal revolution started taking off, I started a blog called coordination problem. And, uh, I wrote to Tyler, who I've known for a long time, and I said, look, I don't understand, you know, this, this, uh, you know, blog thing. I don't understand. I end up <laughs> writing blogs, which are like little short, you know, essays of what yeah. I would have wrote elsewhere. So I'm doing the same thing. It's just like it. And he writes and he says, there, well, he writes back. He's, he's very famous for, for very short answers. And he writes back. He says, there's returns to pithiness, right? <laughs> And I wrote back, because I, I read it, and I said, I don't understand. And he goes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and so then it dawned on me, oh, I'm not supposed to be writing, you know, 1,500-word blog posts. I'm supposed to be writing these little Beautiful short things. things. Yep. Yeah, but anyway. The world's changing really fast in front of our eyes. And if you're not on the internet and you're not utilizing different leverages, whether it be blogs, vlogs, YouTube, I think you're making a grave mistake. Um, so I in college studied econ at George Mason and electrical engineering. Yeah. And um, I was trying to find that, that sweet spot between understanding why people make the decisions they do based on scarce resources and how the world is um, composed and created, um, which I'm still looking for. I haven't found yeah. it yet. But when I discovered podcasting, I was like, this is such a cool platform 
to give myself a voice and then people that I'm interested by a voice. Yeah. And yeah, I don't no, know I, where that's going to go, but yeah. it's going to inform people. That's the goal is to inform people who don't have access to you, who don't have access to the people that I get to meet, but I'm going to have these conversations anyway. So why not just record them, put yeah. them online and then someone can reap the benefit because the more educated they are, the better decisions you're going to make at the end of the day. Yeah. I started, you know, uh, this spring, um, I had the opportunity because of some leave of absences by professors to teach a course that I consider like a dream opportunity to teach. I've wanted to teach it for a long time, but there were more qualified people that were teaching it. It's the, in the core sequence of the PhD program, microeconomics. And so uh, when I was a graduate student, I fell in love with microeconomics. And, um, but I always taught graduate students and undergraduate students sort of more elective type courses like comparative economic systems or things like that. So I got this chance to do this. And when I did, I was like, okay, so I wanna find out a lot about how to maybe share information that's available to people. So is there a really good lecture by Gary Becker here or there that I could then share. And so I started scurrying, you know, like examining as best I could like YouTube. And the amount of knowledge that's available out on YouTube is like ridiculous. Yeah. Um, now it might not be presented always in the most uh, like flashy form, because a lot mm -hmm. of times just talking heads, you know, someone's yeah. sitting there. <laughs> but if you're if you're a graduate student, you know, you're not looking for bells and whistles as much as just you're looking and for so the information. I, yeah, so I started realizing it, and then all of a sudden the the COVID crisis hits, and I have to convert to going online and now doing all this. So I'm like mixing and blending what yeah. I can gather from the internet as well as you know my own discussions and trying to learn. I had never done any of this never taught an online course before. So I was learning it as I went along, flying by the seat of my pants. But what I found, what I, what I've become profoundly fascinated by is if you do the, the information, like you're talking about, right. I mean, you could actually, you know, provide an education for somebody that, you know, doesn't even, never even going to go to college or whatever, right? And then all of a sudden that raises the knowledge level of everyone. Um, yep. And so it's, it's, and you can flip the classroom and yep. you could have more, you know, all kinds of fascinating things, I think. Yeah. So I have regrets about college. I, I was not the best student. I'm going to be hundred percent honest. I was really distracted. I think it's a weird transition when you're like 18 and you have to decide, what you're going to major in in school and then that's kind of your trajectory for the rest of life or at least it feels like that so i was first just econ and i didn't even know why i was doing econ it was because my parents said you have to do something so I'm gonna <laughs> stay um, because it seemed easier than anything else and i read a book by elon musk not by elon musk by Anse, ashley vance who wrote about elon musk and i was like whoa this guy is on another level but if I can be one one hundredth of this guy, yeah. that is amazing. So I switched to go into electrical engineering and econ. And at the same time, I still wasn't fully invested because I was young. I was confused. I, I just wanted to like go after girls. You know, there's just so much more on my mind. Um, and now that I'm older, I can look back on it and I somewhat regret it. But the biggest takeaway I learned was I wasn't paying attention in class the way I would pass all my exams is I would just go into YouTube or the internet and just research and research. And that really did me well for econ and some of electrical engineering. But my big takeaway was with certain majors, I think you don't have to be at school. Don't get me wrong. School gives you a lot of resources, but for the price they're charging sometimes mm -hmm. with the information that's out there and people coming up with more content more efficient content, better, flashier content. And if you can seep through that and find the content that you're interested by, I think for most majors, you don't have to go to school. Now, if we get into STEM, I think you have to be in a laboratory. You need that except expensive equipment. But there's a lot of stuff the internet is giving to people that they can really utilize and change their life drastically. Yeah, I, I don't have anything to really disagree with you on that, except that the following aspect of things. 
So I just was reading a book recently. I can't remember the author's name, but it's called Downsizing the Economics Profession. And the basic idea is exactly what you just said, which is that for a lot of material in economics, uh, you know, you could have the internet is a better source than mo than your modal economics professor getting up there and <laughs> and doing stuff. And and this guy's an economist, and he's he's talking about all that. But you know, at the same time, he's also talking about how you can have uh, the universities turn the economics departments into research staffs, and so then they can do research. But you know, the reality is is that the most important job most economists ever have is their job as a teacher, because you mm -hmm. know, research is you know, uh, uh, you know, ninety percent of research is probably not all that valuable, and only about ten percent of it is really great, and and so it's hard to justify the taxpayers of the state of Virginia paying for all of this wasted research rather than you know this. So we're we're supposed to be teachers. And, and, and I think if, if economics professors embrace their role as teachers, they can help facilitate what you're talking about. Um, they don't substitute for it. They, they, in fact, make it a better process. They're, they're complementarities to it. And yeah. so I'm reminded of Arthur C. Clarke, <clears throat> who argued that any teacher that could be replaced by a prof by a computer should be replaced by a computer. And I just want to say the key phrase there isn't, being replaced, it's can be. So mm -hmm. if a professor is a boring professor that doesn't add to the complementarity of this great access to information and being able to help it to our beginning of our conversation to turn it into knowledge for students, then, you know, then that professor can be replaced. But that puts a priority on the professors that remain that are they have to be the ones that are able to use the resources of complementarities with their skills as coaches or guides mm -hmm. to help people. Yeah. Now, I will just let me say one other thing. And, and, and I want to hear your reaction to it, which is that I actually had a similar college experience. Um, I had a lot of things that I was enjoying in college. It's, it's, it's uh, funny that you mention this because I, <laughs> I just uh, wrote a, a review of a book about science um, where I talk about a particular philosopher scientist who I was introduced to as an undergraduate, but I never really like totally got it until I was in graduate school and I went back. Mm -hmm. So what I did have is I do, I, I am blessed with a good memory but in college, I had too many other things I was enjoying, you know, mm -hmm. to like be, you know, myopically focused on, on economics or even broader, the social sciences. But I really did enjoy studying and took advantage of having all that stuff in the background. It just wasn't the priority. But when I went to graduate school, all of a sudden it became the priority. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to, de de and at, I think at the age of 23, 24, I was a lot more mature of being able to process it than I was at 19, even though it changed my whole career trajectory yeah. when I was 18 and 19, that all of a sudden I was introduced to this stuff. Yeah. But it wasn't the priority until I went to graduate school. And, and that is kind of a funny thing. I was very fortunate. I, I, I think that in many ways, the problem today is whether or not not making that decision truncates your ability of where you can go to graduate school and all kinds of other things, you know. And so, I mean, I was a good student. I, I graduated, you know, with honors from college and all that stuff. But I was behind the eight ball compared <laughs> to a lot of my uh, classmates who were already taking graduate classes basically when they were an undergraduate yeah. and I was kind of like you know uh, beer <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I'm, I'm heading out to have a beer tonight you know I'm exactly. not staying up and 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 uh, so I think that uh, it's fascinating and I love a school like George Mason because um, unlike a lot of places and I taught at New York University primarily before I moved to Mason and NYU in a weird way is is also like Mason in the in the, which is different from like Columbia okay a, a, NYU is a very good very good school it's it's elite students but it's also a school very open to first generation kids 
uh, to people returning to work, you know, after they've maybe failed out of college someplace and then get a job and then make a, and then they do well. Now they have to have a certain test score and other kinds of things to get in. And so that opens it up. But NYU isn't just, I went to Dalton private school and got A's and scored high in my SAT. So then I got into Columbia, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and George Mason is even broader than, than NYU in this regard, in the sense that you have a lot of first generation kids. I'm a first generation college kid myself. Um, and uh, so you have um, uh, that kind of uh, set, kids that go back to school for the, after not getting it or not going to school to start with, women that had their kids and then decide to go back to school. And that diversity of the student body makes the place an extremely, this is when we're meeting in person, <laughs> an extremely uh, dynamic environment. Yeah. And, and there's a lot to learn from that. Now, that's different than what you were talking about, which I think is, 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 um, is also true, which is that there's, for a lot of classes, the sheer information that you can find is available for you easy to get. And so you should make access to that. Mm -hmm. But what you miss out on that, or what I haven't found yet how to do, is to recreate the social learning environment that a really good seminar has online. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say that, you mean like questions and like talking to your peers and stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, I, there, there isn't a great way to do that. A lot of people love messaging. So primarily from work, um, the first six months of this job I'm in as a software engineer, we're just learning software development. So we're learning full stack. So that means front end and back end. So everything you see on the front of the website is basically front end. And then the back end is like the servers and storing all the information. So we learned that over six months when I got started there and we were in the office for three weeks and I know that classroom atmosphere, turning to your buddy and asking him a question. I love that. And then all of a sudden we had to switch to working at home and it completely changed the dynamics, but it made me at least mature more and utilize messaging, utilize um, uh, boards like um, information boards um, a lot of software engineering, you're going to be by yourself and do isolated work. Yeah. So you have to really utilize these forums to find information and kind of understand what those people are saying. Um, and if you do want to do like teach yourself any discipline that you can at home, uh, I don't think there's any perfect way to recreate that environment, but there's ways around it by using question forum boards. Um, to your advantage to get the most out of it. Um, and that's what I was saying. What I regret is if I was older when I went to school for econ or electrical engineering, I probably would have appreciated what I was learning more. And I would have learned the information outside of school using the internet. And then when I got into the classrooms, been better prepared to ask the right questions. Yeah, I that's love that. part of me regretting it. But I think it's an age thing. I think your brain is still developing till like you're 25. Yeah. So I think it's unfair for a lot of people to uh, at such a young age have direction, especially if you don't come from a good home. And I'm not saying that I don't come from a great home. I don't come from a bad home either, but I didn't have direction. I, my parents were working a lot. I just had to figure out things. I didn't even, this is embarrassing to say right now, I didn't even know engineering was a thing until 19, until I read that book about um, Elon Musk. I didn't know about engineering. That wasn't something that was introduced in my life. So as a kid growing up with very little direction, I kind of had to figure out stuff. And it wasn't until I was 22, 23, I was like, yeah. oh, this is what I'm interested in. Oh, I'm not doing this because someone wants me to do this, or my parents think I should do this or my peers are doing this, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna follow what they're doing, but I'm gonna follow what I'm interested in. And when I tapped into what I'm interested in, it was a game changer, because yeah. then you're, you're in a, a mode of curiosity, and that's bliss. Yeah. And you have the best productivity, in my opinion, when you're in that mode of bliss, because yeah. you're just, you're studying, and it's fun, and it's not pushing a, a rock up a hill. It's like, 
it, it's, it, it feels fulfilling. And yeah. that's what I'm still looking for. And I think these conversations, I benefit from so much. Yeah. So, I'm going to send you a copy of my most recent book that I just came out. It's called The Four, Four Pillars of Economic Understanding. <laughs> and uh, the reason is, is because I start by saying that the first thing that we do as, as teachers is try to tap into the natural curiosity of, of students. And then the answer about what economics teaches is that it has these four pillars. Mm -hmm. And so one of them is, I argue, is the, uh, the truth and the light about scarcity and then in response to scarcity, the idea of maximizing an equilibrium and you know all the stuff you learn in econ that is counterintuitive and like shocks you out of your complacency. And I said, but then the message of economics doesn't stop there because economics also teaches you this amazing you know, awe and beauty of spontaneous order, spontaneous coordination of economic activity. And then it also teaches you hope because you can actually lift uh, you know, individuals from the, you know, lowest of circumstances to the, to the highest of circumstances through various different institutional reforms. So there's hope that we can have human improvement. And then finally, who it's compassion because who benefits the most from the human improvement is the least off. So economics doesn't teach, oh, how do I make the rich richer? It teaches how do I make the desperately poor less desperately poor and therefore on a road to like, you know, greater and greater. And I said, so economics has these four pillars, you know, of truth and light, of beauty, awe and beauty, of hope, and then of compassion. But it's all premised on the idea that you first have to turn people's curiosity on mm -hmm. and get them to not look on the blackboard, but out the window yep. to see the world and try to see the world as this amazing, you know, tapestry of human life that we need to understand because it's just as blur to us when we look at it untrained. Yeah. And so I, you know, I, 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 how do I do that? And how do I do that effectively is an ongoing, constantly adapting and adjusting process. And we can't treat it as if it's like fixed and given for all time, yeah. you know? And no, so if we treat crazy. science as fixed and given, that's the end game. Yeah. It stops. It's still over. And so instead, we have to constantly. And so I think these kind of, I love the metaphor. I love the, the consequences of conversation. But I also love the metaphor of a conversation. Because a conversation, a true conversation is ongoing. Yep. And we don't seek to have conversation stopping. We need to, we instead think about how do I start a conversation? How do I ask the right question? And I agree with you 100%. I wish that I could go back in time to some of my professors when I was an undergraduate and bring up the things that I've learned when I was 24, 25 or whatever and go back to when I was 19 and then raise my hand and say, hey, what do you think of this? Yeah. You know, and some of them aren't in economics. I mean, I, I was a joint econ philosophy major. And so a lot of them are in philosophy, you know, questions that I'd be like, hey, you know, have you thought about this? Like, cause I wanna hear what that guy or gal has to say to me about like how I should reorient my thinking yeah. based on this other question. And then we could go from there. But uh, I think it's fascinating the story that you tell about, uh, you know, being able to, to engineering such a um, fascinating and it's a, in many ways, it's the same mindset as economics, but also a slightly different mm -hmm. mindset because uh, or at least it's different from a philosophical economic mindset because yeah. a philosophical mindset is much more about questions and answers. And whereas engineering it tends to be about problems and solutions. Mm -hmm. And so those two, there's a sweet spot where they line up and there's yeah. a sweet spot where they're very diverse from one another. And one of the real problems in economics is when we think of economics as engineering exclusively. And, and then that becomes a problem, I think, you know, and yeah. Uh, yeah. There, there, you know, going back to um, how to find curiosity in people, that's something I think about a lot because even with my peers at my older age, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're ripe old age now, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they've still, so many people, in my opinion, do things for 
um, extrinsic motivation for money. And that's, and I like asked them, why, why did you take this position? Why are you doing what you're doing? Yeah. Like, what is motivating you to get up in the morning? And it, so many people come back down to money. And I'm like, but you're not really curious about the job or the details of what you're doing every day. And they're like, no, not really. But like, it's good money. And like, I can go and watch Netflix after work. And I'm just like, I, this is just insane to think about because if you were just curious about a problem and you are willing to take a risk and believe in yourself. And I think this is where um, some issues stem is in self doubt is in people. I don't know where it's coming from. Is it the media? Is it social media? Is it their parents? There's this, this self doubt. And I used to have this for the longest time where I was just like waking up and I was telling myself bad thoughts about myself. And I started reading and learning more information. And I said, Jay, you need to stop saying this about yourself. This is not helping you. And as soon as I'm diligent about any negative thought, knocking it out of my brain, I think my life changed dramatically because I stopped thinking in group think. And I stopped believing what my peers were believing and going to the extent of what my peers thought. And I started formulating my own thoughts and exploring my own avenues. So I, that's something that I still think about is how to get people curious. And I think it really comes down to that individual. And I think people need more motivation in their life. And that's really abstract. Yeah. It's hard to go and say who needs motivation and what kind of motivation. But the biggest thing I've taken about the internet is finding positive motivation. There's a lot of negativity out there. But if you look for the good stuff and the good positive motivation, I think it can really change people's lives and have them more curious and then have the, I don't know how to say this, quote unquote, better students, the more interested students in the classrooms who are going to be learning more and then learning, they're going to produce something to help society yeah. grow more. Yeah, I think that's, there's a, a lot in that and uh, um, a lot to take out of that actually. Um, so, you know, academics, or scholars, uh, in some sense, are pre are 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 wired, in many ways, to be highly social introverts, <laughs> uh, because we have to get up in front of people and talk in front of them. But at the same time, part of our job is to sit in a library or in our office all by ourselves for sometimes days on end and like it. Otherwise, you can't do the job. So you have to take all your motivation to be internal your energy comes internal rather than external and a lot of other people in the world their energy comes from others out there and i think the problem at the moment is that so much of the self-doubt comes from very low cost negativity because the internet allows people to be anonymous and be negative and mm -hmm. so you think about twitter and young kids so my my youngest son he's studying to be a doctor in physical therapy now but before that he was a uh, basketball trainer he was a strength and conditioning coach and a basketball skills trainer he was a very good basketball player when he was younger and that's what he did when he got out of school and um, he did that for five years with a group called evolution basketball which trains a lot of yeah. pretty high-end basketball players in this area but the kids that were in the public schools so not necessarily the kids that are already in the elite private schools but the kids that are in the public schools the coaches were in talking to steven were pointing out that because of twitter and social media and kids ragging on kids making mistakes in a game. So, you know, they put, you know, Joey in a game and Joey tries to drive to the basket, but bounces the ball off his foot and it goes out of bounds. And then the ne that night when he gets home, there's like a clip of him doing it and then people all dumping on him and mm -hmm. doing all these things like that. And so then the kid is de scared to death to not right. only, you know, and so you can't, play a sport you can't play a, a musical instrument you can't do any of these kind of performance activities if what you're worrying about all the time is if I make a mistake there's physical mistakes and there's mental mistakes and physical mistakes are just part of all activities that we engage in 
you know, mental mistakes, you can try to discipline yourself not to make, but physical mistakes are just part of, you know, doing things. The best players in the world, you know, make physical mistakes all the time. But yet if everyone's clipping you and just being it, to be able to process that and be able to handle that takes a very strong personality. And I don't know if our brains, especially at 15, 16, 17, are prepared to be able to do that. And so, you know, back in the 90s, there was a movie with, uh, I think, Lindsay Lohan was in it. Maybe, maybe she was in it, maybe not, maybe someone else, uh, called Mean Girls. Yeah. And it's all about how, you know, the, 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 the mob in the high school decides yeah. to pick on somebody and then can destroy. And, you know, this is what we have to worry about on the, with the internet, because the internet at the one time can be this amazing liberator for us i mean that was a great promise and yet at the same time can also be this tremendous cesspool in which it sows increasing self-doubt and everything like that at the same time imagine what we just went through and are continuing to go through and if we didn't have you know this widely available internet i mean it 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 would just be horrendous right And, and and yet i mean so yes of course we have this problem of coordinating this massive bomb. We're getting hit with information like out of a fire hose. And yeah, and that's really hard for us to process. But I'm really glad that someone's shooting fire hose is coming at us rather than nothing, you know, yeah, like if there exactly. was only. And so I don't know how to do the balance. I don't know how we're adjusting and adapting and what's it doing to our brains, yeah. actually. Um, so and, there's yeah. a little technique that I, I do. I do, I'm not on social media, so I have a Facebook, but I don't really use Facebook, but I stay away from Twitter because I just hear of the toxicity in it. Yeah. And I stay away from social media in general, and I only really utilize YouTube. And when I utilize YouTube, I utilize positivity. So I'll look up uh, a motivational video first thing in the morning. Yeah. And then right there, after you get up out of bed, the first thing you hear is positivity and you hear these speakers just saying all these kind things about you yourself and how you should think about it. And I started doing that every morning about three years ago and it drastically changed my life to start off something with positivity instead of start off the morning, go onto your social media feed and see, uh, Oh my, I don't look like that person or, Oh, that person's in some nice location. I want to be there. Instead I'd listen to, like I, I, it goes down to the individual and the individual has to take self responsibility at some point and stop feeling sorry for themselves and say, Hey, I need to correct something if I ever want to be something. And I think anyone can be something. They just kind of need that motivation. And even now I have self doubt all the time. Sometimes yeah. I think, what, what are you doing, Jay? This is just stupid right now. Yeah. But at the same time, there's that positivity every morning. And then anytime that I'm in a bad mood, I'll just go and I'll, I'll find some positivity out there. That's great. And yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. It just changes your life. And I come from sports. Like I played basketball growing up and being a teenager and so much insecurity and wanting people to like you. It's a really tough spot to be in. And I didn't have the internet be as intrusive as it is now, but it's definitely a tough spot. But that's what I would recommend to anybody that, is going through a really tough time is to find those good outlets online and it will change your life. And then you just have to remember to be yourself. And I know that sounds really cliche, but at the same time, like you have to remember to not care about what other people think. And that's really tough in high school when you want people to like you. Well, I think, I think that, that, uh, you know, one of, one of my favorite essays by Jim Buchanan was an essay called natural and artifactual man. And what Buchanan focuses on that essay, he has a line in there. He says, you know, man wants uh, liberty to become the man he wants to become. Uh, And the focus is on aspirations. There's a really great philosophy book uh, published about two years ago by um, uh, Agnes Collard at University of Chicago called Aspirations. And I, I, you know, these, I'm I'm, I'm too over- intellectualizing what you just said but the point is is that we need to get young people to believe that they can be the architects of their own life and what are the skills to be a useful architect 
And when you see these things like the data that uh, Angus Deaton and Ann Cates, you know, just recently, re you know, produced right before the COVID thing on their book called uh, Deaths and Despair, uh, what you see is that people are in despair because they don't feel that they're architects over their own life. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it that people have come to view themselves? Now, they highlight things like alcohol and drug abuse and uh, other kinds of you know, issues, but those, I think, are not causes as much as symptoms of something deeper. deeper yeah. And so the question is, is where does this anxiety in modern society come from? And can we think about ways in which we're you know, the, the, the social order is contributing to that or not. And can we figure out the right kind of, you know, both educational mission, but also the reform. I'll go back to my four pillars. Where's the hope? Mm -hmm. The hope has to come in an institutional reform that can, you know, uh, improve the lives of people. And I think how do we make people feel comfortable being an architect over their own life? I think what you're talking about is very useful technique about how you can be an architect because you start from the beginning with the very first thing in the morning, which is you can be, yeah. you, you know, you're the author of your own story. You're okay. positive. You can do it. You don't have to tell anyone else is going to limit you. And so I, I think that's, that's great advice. Something, um, yeah. something I would recommend, and I'm stealing this from uh, Joe Rogan because I heard him first say it and I completely believe in it is uh, I think from a young age, people should be taught martial arts because I've gone through um, being bullied and something I realized about the bullies was they're just really insecure people, but they think they're bigger than you. And if you don't punch a bully in the nose, he's just going to keep coming after you. Yeah. And if kids know from a young age how to fight, I think it's going to cause so much more humility. You know, yeah. it kind of takes you as a person to understand your physical capabilities to say, hey, this person can't pick on me because I also know how to fight. And I think that would, like, what does all this negativity stem from in school is insecurity. But as kids are more empowered at a younger age and given more responsibility, obviously they're gonna make mistakes. But if they're taught such as, uh, things such as martial arts and philosophy at a young age, I think that will empower them to be less insecure and be less judgmental. So that, that's something that I've always thought about as a good um, actionable item that could be done to cause less insecurity so people at a younger age could understand and pursue things that they're more interested by instead of being afraid of what their peers think and what they're going to judge them or bully them about. Yeah, I think um, I mean, Joe Rogan's an amazing story too, right? You <laughs> yeah. Know, I mean, it's amazing, you know, to, to see the influence that he's had. Um, but um, so I, you know, it's interesting that you raise that issue because again, I, I would view that as something where you feel that you are uh, in control of your own destiny, mm -hmm. uh, that it's up to you. Now, is that really true in some major metaphysical like sense or whatever i'm not sure but as a personal like belief mechanism i think it's very valuable and i wonder whether or not the emphasis that we have placed so much on um people being victims has in an ironic sense actually eliminated their ability to be architects over their own life because they're so worried about how others have in fact done it. Now, there is a reality that there was bullies and those bullies are, you know, need to, they, they need to stop bullying, right? Yeah. So it's not defending the bullies at all to say, but what you did by, you know, thinking about martial arts and doing that and empowering yourself, you actually neutralize the bully. Right. So now the bully can't bully you because I did something. I was an architect. And rather than being a victim, you're now like the one who's your own savior against the bullies. And I, I, I worry a little bit about that with, you know, kids growing up today where rather than responding that way, we respond another way, which is that, um, oh, uh, you know, uh, this offends me or whatever. And, and therefore, you know, it offends me, therefore it must stop, 
you know, at some level, rather than the idea of that you just turn around, even in the most basic way, if someone says something to you that's obnoxious, let's say, you know, rather than, than just taking it as an offense, why not flip it back and, you know, on them, right? I mean, like, you know, yeah. screw you, like, you know. I get uh, what you're saying, 100%. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's a it's a very it's 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 a fine line because there is a reality of bullies and bullies need to stop being bullies, but the question is, what's the most effective way to stop them from doing that? Yeah, and I think it's it's you know it's it's so I I I played a lot of sports through college, and one of the lessons I learned from sports, and again, it might not be completely you know, ontologically true, but as a mechanism for what I was faced with is that I learned early on that if I entered the excuse zone, I didn't get better yep. and I couldn't keep competing. So the only way that I could in fact try to keep competing and try to keep getting better was to stare in the mirror and take ownership of my own failures. Mm -hmm. So if I wasn't getting enough playing time, and I thought I should, you know, right? I needed to look in the mirror and say, what could I be doing to make sure that the coach views me as indispensable for their effort to win games? Yeah. So we can pretty much assure that coaches all want to win games. Yeah. Like that's, yeah, the, no. that's homo basketball of coaches, right? Wants to maximize the amount of wins. And so what you need to do is demonstrate in practice and off season and everything like that, that you're vital to that that objective function. If you show that on the margin, they can dispense with you and still win games, then they're going to put you on the sideline, right? But so you yeah. got to show yourself. And that's why you end up by doing things like, you know, showing up early to practice, leaving last, you know, running the extra miles. It's not because you're brown nosing the coach. It's because you're developing mm -hmm. the skill set to actually be the one that's indispensable or whatever. And that means you have to take that ownership if, if, uh, over the, your failures and you learn from your failures. It's not easy to do. It's no. so much easier to say, oh, you know, the coach is, is being a jerk to me, or, you know, that guy cheated, and that's why he's ahead of me, or whatever. Um, and that's our natural, I mean, not, maybe it's not our natural, but my natural thing was to always, you know, like, oh, you know, but learning to face up to your failures. So it, even I carried that over into my academic life, and I've had a very charmed academic life, but also it's been had moments of things where great disappointment and failure. And rather than blaming it on anyone other than myself, I think the message is to learn, look in the mirror and say, okay, this is on me. How can I do better and try to do better on that? And that's, that's just the flip side of the positivity because the positivity is the belief you can do better. Yep, right. Exactly. So you, you listening to those messages. So if I believed all the time I couldn't do any better, then of course it's a spiral into negativity. Tough. But if I have this idea that I can do better, then owning the failure is just the first step. You know. Yeah, exactly. I I uh, I can only speak for myself. But when I was younger, I came from kind of um, a rough upbringing. And I was so insecure, like I hated myself so much. And I was in a deep, dark depression at a young age. And it took me so many years to get out of that. Um, because once I started listening to those positive messages and utilizing the internet in the right way, it changed my life. And it started with daily discipline to where I keep it up today. Every day I wake up at 5 a.m. And I hate waking up at 5 a.m. The alarm goes off at 5 a.m. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? But I get up. I say three, two, one, and I get up. Yeah. And then I feel good about myself because I just did something good for myself. Yeah. And then I'm like, why don't I go to the gym? Okay, let me go to the gym. Okay, now I did two good things for myself. Okay, well, when I go to work and someone has cake, well, I already went to the gym. I already uh, woke up early. I'm going to say no to the cake. It just starts with these daily disciplines. So those are right. some actionable items that people could do is doing that daily discipline. And it sucks. And you have to get used to it. And sometimes there's times when you have been doing it for years and it's still terrible. Yeah, yeah. I but agree with you. the three philosophies I go down to, because I'm pretty much a simpleton, is this is the only things I can control in my life. How hard I work, how honest I am, 
and how well I treat other people. Everything else is out of my control. But I always go down to those three things. And I, I live my life by that because those are, in my opinion, the only three things I can control. Everything else is out of my control. But if you work really hard, and I need to be specific about this because I did this wrong for years. Like when I was younger, I discovered basketball, I think when I was like 12. And that's kind of old to be discovering basketball when you're like 5'11", like yeah, me. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm not uh, an athletic beast. Um, and I was like, I'm going to go to the NBA. This is so cool. <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to work really hard. And I worked really hard. And unless I had like another 20 years to work really hard because I wasn't naturally athletic, <laughs> uh, that dream wasn't going to happen. So understanding that you have to work really hard in something that you have a natural ability in is something that took me a long time. And right now, the reason this podcast started up was um, there's this guy and he has this test at work. It's a, a strength finders test and it's uh, comparable to the Myers-Briggs test. Do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it, it showed my top 10 uh, strengths and my number two was communication. My number three was restorative, which means solving problems. My number four was significance and my number five was um, futuristic. And my number one was competition. And I was looking at my job and I was like, Oh my God, I am not utilizing my top skills right now. And then the speaker was like, instead of, uh, doubling down, uh, instead of increasing what you're like naturally bad at, why don't you double down at what you're good at? And you might go further faster. Yeah. And I had a, I had a crisis. I was like, Oh my God, I've been just trying to become better what I'm bad at. And maybe this is why life has seemed so difficult and hard. Right. So going back to, if you're going to work really hard, make sure you work hard in something that you're passionate about, but at the same time, you're naturally somewhat good at, and you can improve because if you yeah. have no talent, I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's going to be a lot harder. Let me, can I, can I just intersect here? I use the phrase work hard and work smart. Yep. And uh, so I, when I was a little kid, I loved baseball. But when I, but I, I grew up in a basketball family. My dad was a basketball guy and my brother was a basketball player. And, um, and so I, um, you know, basketball was around our house all the time. But when I, up until I was 12, baseball was my thing that I loved. But then, so I'm sixth grade now, so 11 and 12. And so I fell in love with basketball right then. And then, you know, I started playing. So like when I got into high school, I did football, basketball, and baseball. Then I just did basketball and baseball. Then I just did basketball, you know, so as, as it went through the different things. And I gave up football because I wanted to focus more on basketball. I gave up baseball because I had an opportunity to try out for another basketball team in the spring. And so I gave up doing that. And so I go off to college and, and to play uh, basketball. And, uh, and I would describe myself at that time as someone who worked really, really hard, but did not work smart. Mm. So I worked really, really hard at basketball, but I didn't work smart. And anyway, long story short, I ended up by getting hurt repetitively. And that diminished my ability to do certain things on basketball court. Now, in a weird twist, I had started when I was younger uh, working with some people who were involved in tennis to try to help me do improve my lateral movement. Now, I was good at baseball and I was good at basketball, which means I had good hand-eye coordination. So what that meant was that when I picked up tennis, I actually picked it up pretty quickly, but I had no interest in tennis. Tennis was just cross training. It was like a cross training experiment that I started when I was actually 14 years old, but never played tennis. I never played any sets or anything like that. I just did stuff with a tennis racket in my hand to learn how to move like I was doing defense because I was trying to learn how to shuffle from side to side because I was okay going La uh, forward and backwards, but I was not as fast going lateral. And if you play basketball, you know, you got to move laterally, right? Yeah. So this was what I was trying to move. So I, in the college that I went to, I got hurt. I it to help. Oh, what's going on here? Oh, I can hear you. 
You can hear me still? Yep. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the trainers um, uh, wanted me to like work with basketball again to try to help get my lateral movement to improve my, my foot. Uh, my ankle is where I had the injury. So I became obsessed. So then when basketball ended up by being off of the table for me in college, I ended up by being a tennis player in college. Um, and the way I described my tennis career in college was I worked really, really smart, but I didn't work hard because basketball was so devastating when I lost it. I never wanted to vest that much energy in the next thing because I figured if I did, I would never survive. I would just be crushed. But at the same time, I, I'm very competitive, so I didn't want to be crappy. So I learned how to work smart to try to maximize whatever skills I had. And that enabled me to play tennis well. I was a captain of my tennis team in college. I ended up by being a tennis pro when I got out of school. But I fell in love with economics in the meantime. And so I ended up after teaching tennis for a year, going to graduate school in economics. Now, this is the reason for the story is that by the time I got to economics, what I realized for the first time in my life is I could work hard and I could work smart. Mm. And I think that's what happened in economics for me. And as a result, that's why I ha have had whatever career I've had in economics is because I combined the two of those, which enabled me to like move in a way that if I just worked hard, but not smart, or if I just worked smart and not hard, I never would have had the same kind of career uh, that I had. And so I think that's the key thing that you're talking about, because when you combine those things that you're talking about, that's what leads you to working hard and working smart. Because yeah. what you already did was you economized on those things that you have command over, rather than worrying about all the things that you don't have command over. And as a result, that's a very smart thing, because now it allows you to focus. So you focus on the way that you treat other people right? You focus on how hard you work. I, I, in my syllabus for this course that I taught in the spring before the, the COVID stuff, there's a line in there which says, work in proportion to your aspirations. Hmm. Work in proportion to your aspirations. So if you have high aspirations, <laughs> then you got to work your butt off. But if you have like, you're like, eh, you know, I just want to, <laughs> right? Then, you know, take it easy. Like that's yeah. a smart thing to do. And so if we could just, I think what a lot of people have is they have high aspirations, but they don't have a desire to work hard. So then they get frustrated that their aspirations aren't met because they think it should be just, oh, I want to have that. But you have to work in proportion to those aspirations. And again, the positivity of I can do this is really critical to all of it. So exactly, you got to be strategic too. I think to become quote unquote successful in society, because there's no linear path. I don't think yeah. you go to school and you do what you're told, and everything's going to work out at the end of the day. I think you have to be creative and think out of the box, and enjoy it. Something that I struggle with is I'm so I guess futuristic. I'm always looking at the end goal that I forget to enjoy the process of getting there. And yeah. something as I've gotten older is I realize is I have to enjoy the process. I have to not just want to get to Z from A, I have to enjoy B, C, D, E. And I think if you follow what you're curious about, you'll work harder because you're more interested in it and you're more vested in it and you'll make I, a bigger impact and produce I, a better good or service for let people. Let me give you an example of this. Yeah. I, I just started as a, like, about six, eight months ago, started an app called, uh, I didn't start it. I mean, I started using it <laughs> called Blinklist. Okay. Have you ever heard of that? It, no. What it is, it's, it's like basically almost all the books in the world, but it summarizes them in 10 to 15 minute like reads. Oh, so wow. like you can pick up any book, you can just look at it and then you get the main points. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, seven habits of successful, you know, what yeah, books, yeah. whatever New York times bestseller might sure. be out there and you can just read it and look at it. And I benefit from it because it allows me to be aware of what's going on in the conversation, but I don't have to vest all that much time, but there's a big difference between getting the nuggets of the summary versus if I invested in actually learning 
like by reading through a whole book and learning from it and seeing the way the author sets up their argument and everything like that. So I value the, the ability to get to know certain things. But if I really needed to know something, I'd have to go through the long process of slogging through, not the highlight reels. Yeah. And so again, going back to your, your conversation about our current culture, if you think about like even a lot of things like that I love, by the way, again, ESPN, I can follow every game in the NBA and I get to know what's going on in 30 minutes by just going on the ESPN app and clicking on it and I can get the highlights of the different plays or whatever like that. But there's a huge difference between the highlights and what makes up the game, yep. all right? And, and so because we've made highlights, what do we value the most now as young fans watching the NBA? Dunks and three-point shots. <laughs> because setting a pick for a guy to free him open isn't a highlight. But yet yeah. that's how the game of basketball is won. Boxing out so you get a rebound so you can make an outlet pass. No one's going to watch that unless you throw like a Kevin Love, you know, <laughs> whole court, you know, outlet pass. And so it's very weird because it's transformed – the way that you actually watch the game now and who you value in the game, you know, as opposed to say in the past. So when they had the whole thing on about Jordan recently, the last dance, yeah. I was like telling everyone, watch, 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 because you see all the little things that Jordan does on the court, yeah. uh, which are amazing, you know, because it, it, he, he wasn't just a dunker and a three point shooter. You know, he, he, you know, he just, he was all these other kinds of little things, you know? And, and so it's kind of, it's interesting how social media shapes how we even come to appreciate certain things. And that's going to affect scholarship, everything in the future, because now, you know, we worry about Twitter followers, you know, like what you're talking mm -hmm. about before, you know, and, and, you know, how many does this guy have on Twitter, you know, or, or, uh, and, and, um, or, you know, if their blog gets so much traffic or, you know, um, whatever. And so it's going to be fascinating, I think. It's a weird time that, uh we can reach so many people at, at such an instantaneous level and on an international basis. Yeah. I, I can just type something and then someone in China could be reading what I'm typing. It's amazing, right? Yeah. And it's, it's bad in the regard that like, going back to venting, a, a crazy person who's schizophrenic could write something yeah. and have some kind of clout and then put that information out there. And then you as the individual have to decipher what he means. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. Kanye West running for president. I don't know what to make of that. I don't know. I've heard he's bipolar. Yeah. I've heard some of the things he said at a campaign rally. Uh, I don't know what to make of that. And I don't know if, uh, like, it's just weird. It's weird that someone who might be mentally unstable can just influence so many people so quickly. It's a weird time we live in. But going yeah. back to basketball real quick, I'm really interested. Who do you think is the GOAT? Who do you think is the greatest of all time in your opinion? So it's a very interesting question because I'm not so sure that we can actually say those kind of answers because it's so context and training specific to the time. So, you know, instead, I think that there are – so on my personal preference list – of, you know, who could I imagine on a team to make out a team or whatever? You okay, know, in, let me specify that. LeBron, in, LeBron and, and Michael would both be on it, but so would Kobe, you know, and, gotcha. you know, that kind of thing. But, um, but go ahead, specify, because this is a fascinating question. It's even with regard to other sports, tennis, yeah. running, whatever, baseball, you know, you know, what, if Babe Ruth had today's training techniques – right? And, and had the discipline that modern athletes have. Yeah. You know, what would we have seen of a Babe Ruth? Well, my view is that basically greatness translates over time. And so you would see greatness, you know, so Josh Gibson, you know, was great in the Negro League. He would have been great in Major League Baseball, right? It's not like, you know, Satchel Paige was a great pitcher when he was 50-something in the Major League Baseball. Imagine what he must have been like when he was 25 to 30 or whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and so I think greatness travels over time, but you'd have to put it in 
not not like just take them and transplant them but you'd have to put them when they were born in the year so that they would be 25 at the same time lebron was 25 or something like that i see what you're saying okay so they would grow up in the time frame to where we're setting them playing at yes they wouldn't just like be 25 in 1960 and then be 25 in 2020 yeah so you see, see like you see. if you watch tennis for example they show an old photo of Don Budge, who was the first guy to win the Grand Slam in tennis. And when you watch him, it looks like, you know, he's playing in slow motion, right? And you're like, look at that. Like, how the hell could he play against tennis players today? And of course, he couldn't. If you took him and just lifted him and said, here, you know, he never saw a 100 mile an hour serve, you know, he'd be like, ah, you know, what the hell just came at me. But if I would have raised Don Budge here, I'm pretty sure Don Budge would be like a top, you know, you know, tennis player in his time, you know, just like this, because he was so talented that he, he led to the cream of the crop then, he would be there. So I, I don't like the GOAT conversations, because as a kid, I grew up basketball-wise, uh, you know, my basketball years are really from the 1970 to, say, the mid tw- mid-80s. So, you know, of course, I think Bird and Magic are amazing because they're at the back end of it. Of course, Michael and Ewing are already like these huge people in college. So I already know about them and everything. Uh, Magic Johnson is one of my favorite players just because he always seemed like he had such a sense of joy in playing. Yeah. Uh, you know, Larry Bird was pretty amazing because he always seemed like he knew how to make the right shot or the right pass at the right time and did amazing things. But when I was a kid in high school, I loved Wal Fraser, who was the guard for the Knicks. Earl Monroe was amazing, you know, and he never dunked. Earl Monroe did all of his amazing things on the ground. Mm-hmm. He just like spun people around and everything like that. And it was like amazing. Nate Tiny Archibald led the league in assists and scoring. It's like amazing. He was like six foot tall, like, and he did that. Um, I love this guy. He got hurt a couple of years into his career, so you'd never heard much of him. But he played at Providence, and then he was Rookie of the Year for the Buffalo Braves. His name is Ernie DiRigorio. He's a five foot eleven point guard. He had two years in the NBA, which he was amazing. Hurt his knee, and then you never hear about him again. But he was phenomenal, and I can I watched him in the Garden. I grew up outside of New York City, and I saw him catch a ball at the sidelines and throw a perfect pass behind his back to a, you know, a guy slashing down the court for a layup, Bob McAdoo, who's a great player. And it, it just like, you know, like this, like, boom, like, and it was like a rocket and you're watching that and you're like, you go home and you try to do it and you're like hitting your butt with the ball and, <laughs> and all these things, you can't do it. You know? So I, I think basketball players are amazing. Steph Curry is phenomenal given the change of the rules. But, you know, when I hear Oscar Robertson talk about, about Steph Curry, he's right. In his time, the rules under which he played, they would have muscled up Steph Curry so much that he couldn't have gotten free to get his shots. Because yeah. if you watch basketball in the 1970s, they held, they they checked, they did all these things like that, Much which for physical. freedom of freedom of movement, they eliminated. So yeah. like when I was taught basketball, anytime a guy made a cut across the lane, you were supposed to basically hit him like a safety and in football right you're supposed to chuck them off their path and you didn't get called for a foul of that by the time my son was playing in high school if you put a hand on a defender you know they're like you know like this and it's like you know I'm trying to teach my son the tricks of playing basketball you know and I'm like oh yeah when the guy goes up to hit a jump shot just push his hip just a little bit turns his shoulders he can't make a basket and you know and then he tries to do it in a game and I blow a whistle on him like no what are you doing you know but so I, uh, so he had to learn his own tricks, you know, whatever to play, to compete and all that. And so it's just interesting, but I, I watching Jordan, uh, in the, in the last dance again, and just watching the tremendous skill set that he had across all of basketball, which includes, you know, his defense, his passing, his, uh, you know, uh, uh, ex- unbelievable explosiveness or whatever. Now, He's not six foot nine. And, and so LeBron is six foot nine. I mean, yeah. I've sat, you're, you're, you're remote now, but in distance, <laughs> you're about two feet from me. 
So I've sat three feet from LeBron, okay, okay. and in Vegas, okay. uh, you know, in a, in a tournament. And he was right in front of me, didn't have a shirt on, okay? <laughs> and he has across his back, if you look it up, he has a tattoo that he got when he was 14 years old. Say the one or something? The chosen one. The chosen one, yeah. And it's in letters that are about this thick. You're probably like three inches. He got that when he was 14. He was built <laughs> like this from that age, right? And so his shoulders are huge. I mean, this guy is an Adonis. His shoulders are like this, and it goes down to a waist like this, and he moves like a point guard. He has amazing, you know, vision, and he – it, it, so, and, and just look at him, he's 17 years in the league and he's still able to do what he, what he does. And so, yeah, I mean, he's phenomenal. <laughs> I get, I, you know, I watch it, but when I see Jordan, I just, it's maybe it's because of age, you know, or whatever, yeah. or when I saw him, but I watch those old bulls and I'm like, oh my God, look at this guy. You know, LeBron never got thrown to the ground the way that Jordan did against the, the, the yeah, Pistons. Exactly. And, and the world never would have allowed that to happen, yeah. you know. Um, but, but LeBron gets fouled, like, all the time, though, too. Like, yeah. I watch the games. People say, oh, he whines about, you know, everything. He gets hacked, like, ridiculous amounts of time, and they just let him get away because he's so strong he goes through. It's like when Shaq played. Yeah, you know, exactly. They could that every time, but. Anyway, like Stephen Curry going are, to the basket. Yeah, yeah, all of these guys are so amazing. I'm watching the games now. They just started right. this last just, week. Yeah. And it's interesting because baseball, to me, uh, as a spectator, I love watching pitcher duels and all that stuff like that. But because the stands are empty, it <laughs> seems like a practice is going on, right? It seems like they're just engaged in practice. But basketball, because they're, it's more intimate – and it's more like how these guys all grew up playing in gyms in for AAU or pickup games where there's no one around watching except for the other players waiting to go play, right, in the yeah. game. That it to me, it doesn't seem so remote from the game because the way they have it, they darkened out all the area so you don't see you the absence see, yeah. of fan. And so it's just the game. And then you watch the game, and the game is so – they started out like even in normal season – I love watching the NBA the first three weeks of the season and then the last month of the season. And I hate, like, if you would have came to me and said, hey, I got these great tickets to uh, go see the Wizards play, you know, <laughs> the Nets in February or whatever, I'd be like, all right, you know, we'll late <laughs> to the game, you know, because those guys are so beat up and they yeah. take off the plays and like that. But right now they're playing like for their life it's and they'll play in these playoffs. And so you watch them and it's like, they're just amazing athletes. And yeah. so um, I just love it. So it's hard for me. That's a long winded way, but it's hard for me to say that there's a goat like clearly yeah. But if I had, if you put a gun to my head and said, you have to pick a goat, I would say Michael Jordan. Yeah. Well, I haven't fully finished the entire documentary, The Last Dance, but I'm very fascinated by Jordan's mindset and like the little things that he would take sensitive and he would choose and pick what he took as motivation. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's psychopathic to, to a degree, <laughs> but I think it's necessary if you want to become great. Like yeah. you have to take issues with little, little things. And it's kind of weird because I do something similar where like I will be extra sensitive to something that someone might say, but it gives me more motivation to work a little bit harder. To see Michael Jordan say that is so fascinating. So I'm agreeing with you completely. And I was going to specify if I had to choose one player to build a team around right now, it would be Michael Jordan because of that mental edge. Yeah. You know, I, there's something you can't train about that. Great athletics is great and all, but that mental fortitude to push you through those hard times is a skill that is developed that I think LeBron has, but not to the psychopathic degree that Jordan has. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, Jordan is a whole new le uh, level except for Kobe. Yeah. So Kobe had the same thing. So I don't know after – so 2020 has sucked – for me, you know, there was a thing where, when did you know that 2020 sucked? As like the day that I found out that Kobe Bryant died, because it like really freaked me out. I couldn't believe it. Such a young man had so much in front of him. But you, I don't know if you know this, but since he retired, uh, certain players have been 
getting trained by him. So he's training. So one of them was, you know, uh, Jonas, right? So yeah, he's yeah. coming up, he wants to learn how to play. And so they would go out and train with Kobe. And Jonas was saying that this is before he died. He was just talking about it last summer. And he was like, you know, I always wanted to beat him to the gym, but I never could beat him to the gym. <laughs> so he said, I got up one day at 4.30 to try to get him, you know, beat him to the gym. And he was already there. And he's like, what took you so long to get there? And he's like, there was never a time that Kobe didn't get there before him and get all ready to get to, to do the workout. Yeah. And so it's like this amazing, you know, thing or mentality that you have. And I think that those two athletes, in a way, had that. In tennis, Nadal has that. Yeah. And so it's very interesting if you watch the difference between Nadal and Federer. So Federer, uh, aesthetically, is someone I personally love to watch play tennis. I don't like aesthetically watching Nadal or Djokovic play tennis, but I appreciate their grit and what they bring and the fact that they never give up on anything. Mm -hmm. Whereas Federer, it's almost like you took, you know – like a combination of all the great players in the past and like squished them into one. So he has a serve like Sampras. He has like crown strokes like, you know, Borg or whatever. And you put all these people together and you're like, okay, that's great. And I, and, and I love what he's been able to accomplish. I mean, we've been very blessed as tennis fans for this era to see these guys have the longevity and how great they are. But when he's playing Nadal, I never believe he's going to win. Because I always think Nadal has another gear that he's going to find. Yeah. You no, know, I want Federer to win. I'm always like on nerves the entire time <laughs> that it's not going to happen because there's gonna, he's going to find another. Yeah. You know, Nadal's going to find it. And Nadal has that mentality similar to Kobe or, or these other yeah. ones, which is like, you'd have to drag me out of here dying before you're going to beat give me. Give up. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that's pretty phenomenal Fortitude. skill. Yeah, it's a, it's a mental thing that you have to get into. And I've heard a lot of Navy SEALs talk about it. And, and they have that mentality that you're going to have to drag my dead body off of here to, for me to quit. And you know what's weird is looking at technology, Elon Musk has a similar quote to that, that he'll just never give up. Like as much mental pain as he is in, like I believe it was in 2008, both his companies, Tesla and SpaceX, or about to um, close down because they're running out of money. Yeah. And he's just like, I'm not going to quit. I'm just yeah. not going to quit. So it's interesting to see that kind of mindset be duplicated from sports where I predominantly see that type of mindset to technology yeah. where one saw, man can do so much. I, I, I in a sort of a weird set of circumstances, I ended up by having dinner once with Peter Thiel. Oh, wow. And okay. Peter Thiel spent the time at dinner uh, he was talking to basically very similar to you were about the future of college uh, mm -hmm. for, as you might know, he, you know, he has that kind of view as well. But one of the examples he was using is Elon Musk because he was talking about the signal aspects of college, but he says there's cheaper ways to get the signal than actually attending college. Yeah. And he used Musk as an example because Musk got accepted, I guess, to Stanford's you know, program or whatever. And he signaled that, but that's all that anyone needed. They didn't need him to go through all that because they just let him do his thing, you know? Yeah. And, and so, uh, but he was talking about how impressive Elon Musk is. Yeah. And, you know, for someone like that to say that, that demonstrates just how, you know, that's, you don't impress someone like Peter Thiel that easily. Right. No. So, yeah. so he was talking about it. So you're like, Hmm, I better pay attention. So, yeah, I mean, these guys, you know, they're, there, I think people who are serial entrepreneurs, uh, you know, are pretty amazing. Same thing with artists yeah. that are very driven. Um, you know, I, I, I wish that I um, could meet some. Like, there, there, there's a funny thing. There used to be this book. I can't remember the the author. But what they do is they used to put together two famous people for a breakfast. And so they would put them together and then they like, so one of them was Milton Friedman with 
Yogi Berra, <laughs> the, the baseball player. And like, then they would like record their conversation about what they talk about. And I, I tend to think that there's like fascinating opportunities for like scientists to interact with artists that yeah. we don't do enough because our worlds force us to separately, yeah. but that artists think differently, more creatively uh, in, in some sense, scientists think creatively as well, but it's, it's more disciplined, I guess. One is creative, but maybe less disciplined at some level. And there's some kind of overlap between those things, which could be really fruitful and beneficial. And I, I just don't have enough opportunities, I guess, yeah. No, I, I completely agree with you. That's such an interesting concept about putting two quote unquote successful people in their disciplines and having them talk. Because I think you would have a lot of similarities in terms of mindset, but in two drastically different areas. Yeah. So I always can like a little bit about myself is I'm also an actor and I've been doing that. I, I got into that in college where my GPA was low and I needed to boost it. And I was like, what is the best class, easiest class to take to get an A? And I took an acting class and I loved it. And I was like, I really <laughs> enjoy this right now. So it's weird because I, I completely understand what you're talking about when you're talking about science and art. With engineering, it's kind of black and white. It's you're right or you're wrong. You're producing yeah. or you're not. But with acting, it's so subjective and it's so creative. And what you could think is a great performance, I could think is complete shit, you yeah. know? So it's just so weird. But if you put two people in two different disciplines that are very successful, I think that would be a great format for a show, to be yeah, honest, yeah. because my eyes would be glued to that kind of conversation. Yeah, I'm I think curious. it's it's interesting. The, I, I, I like this podcast called Hidden Brain. I've never heard of it. It's, it's on NPR. And uh, they were talking about creativity in one of them. And they use an example of Yo-Yo Ma. Uh, again, I don't know enough. I just heard it on a podcast, so it might be completely <laughs> BS. But, but uh, they say that every summer, he gets together musicians from throughout the world that, that are specialists in different kind of genres. And then they get together in, their, in this remote area. And then they try to make music together. And so it's it's combinatorial. So this one was totally weird because it was talking to this woman who is a bagpipist, but she's the best bagpipe player like in her region of the world. And so she got put there together then with someone else who like is a you know a flutist or flautist or whatever you say and that they get together and then all of a sudden they try to make beautiful music. Now sometimes it doesn't come out beautiful, but sometimes it does. And it's this like weird kind of experiment that they try to do in combinatorial thinking. And I tend to think that that a lot of really creative work in the sciences is all about combinatorial thinking yep. rather than de novo thinking. It's always like, so the classic example in from our world or whatever would have been, uh, you know, uh, Steve Jobs taking calligraphy and then being able to fit that with the design of software for fonts and being right. able to get fonts. And then that combination of what he learned over here at Reed combined with this demand for software for fonts and then being able to mix them and then you don't have just times new roman you yeah. know, or dot same, matrix same you know yeah, yeah yeah and and so it's that kind of of combinatorial thinking that i uh that certain institutions are conducive to and other ones constrained but fascinating so what kind of roles have you played in uh in in, in as an actor so I, I have done, um, uh, most recently it was a story about an immigrant who came to America. His father was in the war. He served in the Marines um, and he believed in holistic medications and helping people through natural remedies. It's called The Sun and the Medicine Man. It's actually a, a short film by a MFA student at George Mason University. Oh, wow. It's supposed to premiere in spring, but because of COVID, it's being pushed back. And now I believe it's coming out in the fall. They're trying to figure that out. Well, but, make sure you tell me the premiere. I, I definitely want to go see this. Oh, for sure. It's a great, yeah. it's based on a real story um, of the MFA student, Andrew. And um, I believe it was his grandfather, the story is about. Um, but I don't want to give away the end, but I was playing basically the son of the medicine man. 
Yeah. And uh, that was my most recent role. I've been doing, so I started acting about three years ago in college while I was doing this double major. I always do this. I always bite off more than I can chew. Yeah, yeah. But I like it. I like being a little That's bit awesome. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I started to get roles after that acting class. And I was like, before this, I had no, no confidence. Like when I was a kid, I was like, oh, that's really cool. You can get paid to like do make-believe. Like I want to do that. <laughs> and my parents are very traditional. You know, you go to school, you become a doctor, a lawyer, whatever. And I get it. That's a safe, smart route, but it's not always the best route for everybody. Yeah. Um, but I was always trained in that mindset and I had no confidence. And I think it, it took me to be older to say, oh, wait, if I had actually gone to school for this, maybe I could have some traction there. Yeah. So um, after uh, that class, I, I went out for some roles and I started getting some stuff. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. This is money. Like I'm getting paid. But then I was already two years into school. I was so invested uh, financially wise and so much of my time had gone to pursuing these degrees that I was like, okay, let me take a step back from acting for a second. I'm overworked. I'm not giving the best of my performances. And at the end of college, I'm going to come back to it. And if I still want to do it, then I'm going to do it. And then at the end of college, I was like, I really want to do this. Like this is, feels like a calling. This feels, it feels good. It feels natural and I'm doing it. I'm in tune, everything is clicking. Um, but then COVID kind of happened and uh, didn't kind of happen, it did happen. And the work started drying up. So I've done a bunch of small roles. There's a lot of industrial work in this area. So like um, videos you'll see for schools and stuff like yeah, yeah. that. Um, but if I wanted to really pursue it, I think I would have to move to New York or LA or maybe even Atlanta, Georgia where there's a bigger market um because it's hard and i'm going to be very blunt it's hard if you're not white uh the way from an actor's perspective in my perspective it's a, it's 70 percent white um casting 20 percent black casting uh and then maybe five ten percent wild card and i fall into the wild card uh -huh. so it's a numbers game i have to go out for a number of auditions in this area i don't get a lot of opportunities unless it's industrial work and then they want people in their thirties or forties. So I'm already too young and then I'm the wild card. So it's an uphill battle, but I like the art so much about it. And I like the, what's the word? Peculiar uh, nature of it, of jumping from not learning one discipline, but kind of being a jack of all trades uh -huh. and learning about being a doctor to a lawyer, to um, someone suffering from drug addiction. I find it fascinating and I'm, I'm very curious. So I'm very attracted to that art form and learning everything, but it's one of those things where there's so much out of my control and you have to go into a room and say, please pick me, like, please like me. And I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Um, but I'm still going to pursue it and see where that takes me. Um, so that doing the podcasting at the same time, but acting is definitely one of those passions where I, I love, I love the That's art great. of it and yeah. it's very creative. And I think in today's age, it's very hard to be creative. It's really easy to replicate, replicate things, but it's hard to be creative. And acting is one of those things where I feel like I can genuinely be creative and novel. Yeah. Um, so I really do. That's really awesome. It's a, it's such a powerful medium. So I, I never saw the play Hamilton on Broadway, but I watched it as soon as Disney Plus opened <laughs> it up earlier this last month. And I mean, it's just such a powerful way to communicate to people. Um, I mean, there's a big responsibility because of the power that's involved, but it's an amazing, uh, and the talent that's involved in being able to create something like that is phenomenal to me. Um, yeah. So. I think it, my son, my son is a musician uh, and he lives, he lives in Brooklyn. So okay. he did what you, you were just talking about, which is he tried to, to do what he's doing in Richmond where he went to school and then he lived in Philadelphia and in Baltimore and DC and he had pockets of success in all of those, but eventually, you know, three, four, a little over three years ago, he moved to New York and he loves it. I mean, his yeah. life has been 
uh, much better since it's there. I mean, he's in a very small niche market of what he does, but it's just New York City is New York City. It just has all those opportunities and everything available to him. It's going to be interesting for artists, I think, in New York City and L.A. because of uh, lockdown. I don't know if we're calling it lockdown anymore, but like not being able to go out. And yeah. most of that, th those towns, I believe, are populated by artists. And if they can't work and support themselves, why are they paying these high taxes to live in that city if yeah, they're not terrible. reaping the benefits of it? Yeah, so he hasn't played a live show in five months now. Yeah. But he and his friend have a record store. Oh, okay. uh, they, it, it, that sells, uh, you know, experimental music. It's in Bushwick section of Brooklyn and it's called a thousand dead gods. <laughs> and even during the, the lockdown, they were selling online. Mm -hmm. So they would sell online and then he would be able to go into the store, get the inventory that he had to do and then mail service, you know, that. Yeah. So they were able to keep that alive. And as I said, it's a niche market. Um, so it's not like a mass market, but they're able to survive yeah. and their store when it's normal times, the store also promotes shows oh, in okay. the city besides their own stuff. And sense. so it's kind of all part of the DIY culture that, yeah. you know, is, is your generation, uh, yeah. basically, uh, and, uh, and they make a go out of it. I mean, and, and, uh, I'm very proud of him because he's, He's very entrepreneurial about it, which yeah. in a way, you know, it, would it have been the life I would have picked for my son? No, because <laughs> I wanted him to, you know, if it was up to me, he'd be like a professor at a university teaching musicology, you know, <laughs> and, and striving to get tenure and all. He didn't want any of that stuff, right? He's a yeah. very smart kid, but he wanted to do what he wanted to do. Um, and he's doing that and he's been able to do that. And so I'm very proud of him for being able to do that. Um, and he uses his music as his way to express a lot of the same things that you were talking about or the angst of growing up in this day and age about, you know, especially in Northern Virginia where he grew up and the kind of things that he um, found disquieting about mm -hmm. that and stuff, which maybe I wasn't attentive enough to. Um, yeah. So, um, but um, yeah, you know it's a weird thing. I'm curious, do you think capitalism is dying? There's a lot of um, billionaires out there that's saying the inequality gap is very large, such as Ray Dalio and Warren Buffett. And then if uh, we have a democratic president and all the houses are democratic, um, do, do you think capitalism will die down in America? What is your opinion on that? So that's a great question. I. Uh, I think that there's some legitimate arguments against the existing status quo, uh, which are because we're not really in a capitalist economy. We're in a crony capitalist economy in which we've created structural inequalities um, for a variety of reasons that are related to what I would identify as special privileges that have been granted to some at the expense of others. And I don't believe that that's necessarily endemic to capitalism if we, if we had the right rules. So go back to my four pillars again, right? One of them is hope and institutional problems demand institutional solutions. And so we have an institutional problem that's being identified. What the problem is, is not billionaires, right? So that's where I would disagree. So I just recently read Bigger Than Bernie yeah. which is a book about the Bernie Sanders movement and everything. And I have a lot of sympathies with aspects of what the people there want to get in terms of uh, injustice that needs to be corrected, uh, wars that don't need to be fought, you know, all these kind of things like that. I share their passion and compassion for the least advantage or anything like that. I just think they have the wrong means to obtain that end. They think the answer is to empower the state because they think that the state will then be utilized, the workers will be the ones who are in control of the state. The reality is the state officials are the ones who are in control of the state. And the state officials are gonna rearrange the system to benefit themselves at the expense of others. And so as a result, you perpetuate 
So to me, the kind of policies that a Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and AOC uh, would promote would actually exacerbate the problems they're trying to solve rather than solve the problems. On the same time, you know, the Mitch McConnells of the world and all these other ones, they're not a solution either. I mean, you know, so uh, it's not like I see any salvation on either one of these fronts because I think our current conversation is totally messed up. And that I, so I think there's, there's three serious economic policy questions in the United States. The first one is the fiscal gap the amount of obligations that the government has taken on that it has to meet in 25, 30, 40 years from now, and the ability 25, 30, 40 years from now to pay to, the, to that, given the realities of the demographics and everything else, that gap is growing and growing and growing, which is very, very damaging to the long-term health of the US economy. The second one is the extraordinary measures that the Fed has taken on during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, and then now has led to a situation where the Fed is supposed to basically just keep printing money to solve all our problems. And we need to figure out an end game strategy to that. And how do you unwind that? And we're not having that conversation. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is the structural inequalities, which I argue is because we've increased such restrictions in the labor market. We've made labor markets more less fluid than they used to be. And as a result, people get sidetracked in their ability to move up the quintiles. So it's not that if you look at the United States and you look at a Gini coefficient, that is the measure between you know, the, 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 the uh, riches and, uh, and inequality. It appears that we're this really unequal society. But if you look at mobility between the quintiles, historically, the United States was the most equal. So someone who's in the bottom quintile can rise to the top. Someone who's in the top can go to the bottom. And what's been captured in the work by people like Raj Chetty and others is that that mobility has slowed. And then the question that I think you have to ask is, why did the mobility slow? And I think it's because of we've gummed up our labor markets. We've caused all kinds of restrictions and whatnot in labor markets. In, in fact, that, that has slowed down that growth. So there's real reasons for the death and despair that we need to think about. But the question is, is I don't think that's because there's some billionaires right? Jay-Z and Beyonce are billionaires. They're not the reason why we're, we're frustrated in the world, right? Uh, and I think that's also true for people that are, you know, big finance people that act on, you know, speed trading or whatever and make a boatload of money. They're not the reason why we're frustrated. Let me just say one last thing about this, which is kind of a weird example. But if you go online and you look up these experiments with the Kapuchkin monkeys, it's a very interesting thing. So they have uh, these two monkeys, at term, Kapuchkin monkeys. It turns out Kapuchkin monkeys will strictly prefer sweets to just uh, plain like fruit or vegetables, but they can survive on just the regular vegetables. So they have in front of them, the distributor has in front of her cucumbers and grapes, okay? And the, the monkey has to do a task. And the reward for the task is going to be one of these things. So the first monkey goes and does the task and gets given a cucumber. The monkey eats the cucumber and is quite happy. You know, they're, they're, they're eating a cucumber. It's fine. The second monkey does the task. But when that monkey finishes the task, the distributor gives it a grape. Now this monkey, the first monkey is looking over and sees there's a grape and they know the difference between grapes and cucumbers. And so sees that and then this monkey eats a grape, is very happy. So then turns to this monkey and says, do the task again. And the monkey goes to do the task, it puts its hand out waiting, you know, now it thinks it's gonna get a grape, instead gets a cucumber again, takes a bite of it, then throws it back at the, at the, at the, the mm. experimenter. Yeah. Then, 
you know, does the second monkey, gives it the, the grape again. All right, this monkey's happy. This monkey's really pissed. Does the task again. Now really is expecting, you know, to get the thing. Gets the cucumber again. Doesn't even taste it this time. Just takes its hand out and hits the thing like that. The second monkey goes, gives a grape again. And now it gets interesting because the monkey now is outraged. But who is the monkey outraged against? The monkey shakes the cage at the distributor not at the other monkey. So it's wrong to think that we suffer from envy, right? Which is if the monkey was envious, the anger would be directed at monkey two, not at the distributor. Instead, the monkey is upset with unfairness and therefore is shaking the cage at the person responsible for the unfairness. I think we're misidentifying when we say, oh, look at these billionaires, because we think it's the other monkey that has it. Where really what we're worried about is we think that that other monkey has those billions because this distributor, let's call it the government, is doling out favors to their friends. And it turns out sometimes that's right, yeah. <laughs> right? They're, they're gambling with other people's money. So you look at the big banks after 2009, right? And they got bailed out. You know, it's, I don't know if I use this joke when you were in, in class, but I, I sometimes try to teach moral hazard. I say to the students, I say, hey, you know, I'm going to take you to Vegas this weekend. And, you know, I pick one of the students out. I said, we're going to go to Vegas and I'll cover all your losses, but you get to keep all your profits. I said, how are you going to, how are you going to bet? Are you going to bet on the slot machines? Or are you going to be at the roulette wheel? And I was like, oh, I'm at the roulette wheel and I'm betting. I said, oh yeah, I didn't realize your name was Goldman Sachs. You know, <laughs> nice to meet you, Goldman, you know, like that. <laughs> it's not that Goldman Sachs got crazy. It was that Goldman Sachs did exactly what they were, was rational for them to do, given what the expectations of the game were. But who created those expectations? The government, the central distributor in this case. Yeah. And so it, it, if we think that it's because rich people are rich, that poor people are poor, what we have to worry about is not that they're rich, but who was unfair in the way that they dealt it out. So we tend not to be upset about LeBron becoming a billionaire or, or Michael Jordan becoming a billionaire or Beyonce or, or, you know, anyone like that. But we tend to those, those, um, you know, not even Bill Gates, because we see that Bill Gates created all this software that we have or not Steve Jobs or whoever, you know, because we see that we use an iPhone and we love it, you know, and things that we don't know. But we tend to think that people that do things that we just take for granted, having lots of money is somehow bad. Let me tell you one other story is when I was a kid, when I got out of, out of college, I started working as a tennis pro. I, I was teaching a tennis area, which is a very wealthy area of New Jersey. And uh, the people there that had these giant mansions were, uh, there weren't Orthodox, but they were conservative Jewish people from Sheepshead Bay in Long Island, who in the summer vacationed here. <clears throat> so they followed the Sabbath. But unlike Orthodox, they, they had a huge party before sundown. <laughs> so they would start on, you know, having these huge parties on, sa on Friday nights. So one of the things that they did, they all had these mansions and they all had tennis courts in them. And they would rotate in the community between them this is late 70s, early 80s. So tennis is really popular at the time. And they would hire all the tennis pros from the area to come and play doubles matches, right? The tennis pros would play doubles matches and they would bet on them. And some of them would join in and be part of a team, the better players or whatever, but that's what they did. So we would rotate between these houses. So I'm an economics guy, even though I'm a tennis pro, right? I study economics. Yeah. And I'm also looking at these houses and these houses are like bigger than anything I've ever seen. So I'm kind of curious, like, how the hell do you have all this? You know, I'm materialistic enough. I want a Mercedes and I'd like to have a big house like this. So every single one of them, it was shocking to me because I thought they would tell me that they invented some exotic thing. So the very first guy that I meet, he says the following thing to me. I go to him. I said, so how'd you get all this like this? And he says, um, 
He goes, your mother ever tell you don't get your panties in a bunch? And I said, <laughs> oh, yeah. He goes, yeah, no one wants their panties in a bunch. He says, I sell the elastic on people's underwear. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, what do you mean? He goes, yeah. He goes, I sell the elastic. I'm a wholesaler. I sell the elastic that goes into people's underwear. Everyone, BBD, all of them. They fruit loop. They all. They are, you know, fruit loom. They all have to get their like rubber from me. Yeah. And then I start doing the calculation. It's like everyone has underwear. <laughs> everyone needs the elastic around the under. This guy sells a product for you know ten cents to like the entire planet. So yeah. no wonder he has this big house, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Two weeks later, I'm at another guy's house. Same thing. I'm sitting there next to the guy. And I say, like, uh, you know, what do you do for a living, you know? And he says, you, you know the, the plastic that goes out on the end of a shoelace? He goes, I sell all of that, you know, to the world. <laughs> and I'm like, really? And I look at him puzzled. And he goes, do you ever lose that plastic on your shoelace? And you have to tie your shoes or thread your shoes through your things. You got to lick it. You got to twist it. You got to do it. No one wants to do that. They want that plastic thing around there. And I was like, yeah, they do. And so what it dawned on me, I was all of 22 years old, right? What dawned on me is that the secret that a lot of people have to making a ton of money Get in the plastic is actually, yeah, it's actually the most basic thing that everyone demands, right? Yeah. And so when we have this wide, so rather like my son who makes music for, you know, 500 people in the world, yeah. you make music that like Beyonce makes music, which is like millions of people want to listen to her music, right? And so this is a kind of an interesting lesson, I think, but we don't tend to, to understand that when it comes to finance. Like, why is it that the speculator is doing something? So they make these rewards. But, so I think we misidentify where our anger is directed. And mm -hmm. I want to redirect that anger at the people who are being unfair in the game of distributing the benefits to certain people. Yeah, and no, I understand. Yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, I think that I, I understand there's a huge amount of an, an, an anthropomorphism when I'm looking at the Kapuchkin monkeys <laughs> and I'm inferring their emotional state from, you know, where they're shaking. But I, yeah. I, I think there's something valuable in us thinking about where our anger should be directed at. Yes, I agree to the extent that it doesn't stifle competition. Like yes. I'm a big proponent of the free market. And uh, if that company produces a good or service, um, they should be rewarded if it's helping yeah. the community and people want to pay for it and it's making jobs, it, yeah. it's bringing up society, but to a point where they want to be the only player in the game and be a monopoly. Um, that's where it becomes detrimental. Yeah, yeah. Like, so you just saw this, but like we just like Jeff Bezos gave a very passionate defense the other day about you know his model. But you know people were complaining right about uh, Amazon, right? So mm -hmm. the various people on. The, but imagine what we would have just gone through if there was no Amazon. So we assume a costless alternative. Now, I, does, does Amazon have, of course, some protections from government? You know, look what just happened in Northern Virginia, right? We gave them like a ton of stuff for them to relocate here in Northern Virginia and have their headquarters here. And George Mason is part of that deal and everything. Like I teach at a, a state university that gets a lot of benefits from the state. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to say that I'm innocent or that there's some kind of clear cut distinction, but it is the case that I do think that we sent, we tend to think that sometimes that wishing it so makes it so, and that's not fit with reality. And so what I worry about is like, so for example, is Facebook a platform monopoly or did we just forget that there used to be a thing called MySpace? And now, and now yeah. Facebook is just happened to be the dominant one today. And that if the government doesn't just protect Facebook, that in probably another few years or whatever, there'll be an alternative framework that's up there. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we really want is competition. What we really want is, con well, I like the term contestation even better than competition, what which is that? is that, so there's constant contestation, meaning that someone is always there to contest me for the, my, my role that I'm playing. So even in academia, the fact that I put forward a theory 
it demands contestation from other theorists so that I constantly am checked against just coming up with, right? And science yeah. in some sense should hurt, meaning that if I engage in a statement, someone contests me and, and, and beats me, that yeah. should hurt. I should feel like the pain of that. So it's like the pain of a loss. So yeah. again, it's kind of like too Jordan-esque or, or, <laughs> or, or Kobe type of thing. Um, you know, it, it's like, I actually think it's really important that Byron Russell has yeah. to stare down Michael yeah. Jordan holding his follow through at the end. <laughs> right kind of thing because yeah. that makes you know byron russell now more motivated to try to be a better so i think this contestation aspect as long as as markets are full of contestation then the bigness of a firm isn't the problem as long as it's constantly challenged but yeah. if a firm is big and it's never challenged then you get all the bad stuff exactly and, and part of the problem with the government in my mind, and again, I should be checked on this, but is that they play favorites with big firms. Mm -hmm. And what they do is in the name of protecting competition, they end up by protecting firms from competition. Yeah. And that's where it all goes bad. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's a complicated thing because then if you look at the government, you have to have elected officials who aren't taking money from these big companies. And... <laughs> They're not yeah. getting paid the best. So yeah. it's a tough job if you want to get into politics because you're going to be disliked most likely, but you have to have people like you to get elected. And then yeah. you have to make the tough decisions and not be persuaded by money. So it's a very tough decision if you want to go and work for the government, um, especially with these big tech companies and them dominating can, um, and I, I believe can I ask in you a question again about acting though, real quick, because it's right. related to this about yeah. stuff, because I do think that there has been a lot of privileges that yeah. have been doled out and you raise that issue as well in terms of uh, biases and whatnot. I, I just watched the documentary on Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you saw it. It was on 30 by 30. It's yeah. very, it's, I haven't it's seen very, it. Yet. It's very good because it points out that like, so he was, He's the one who invented and came up with the concept uh, for the TV series that ended up by being the, the, I can't remember the name of it now, but David Carradine ended up by being chosen over him for it. It's, a, it's where a, a monk comes and lives in America and the American West and travels around, but he's a Asian, you know, monk, Chinese, Chinese monk. But what happens is that they picked a white actor Mm -hmm. to play because Bruce Lee's accent they thought couldn't sell and all these things like that. And, and then Bruce Lee ended up by d going to Hong Kong and then doing his movies and all that. So that the rest is history there. But the question I have for you is that how much do you think things are going to change in terms of the demand on the actor side or on other sides for more uh, diverse roles for ethnicities, gender orientations or whatever. So, you know, a few years ago, I don't know if you remember, they were gonna do a movie about Michael Jackson and Elizabeth Taylor, which is based on a true story. They had to rent a car and drive across the country together because of something getting stuck or whatever. And they were gonna use the guy, um, uh, uh, the finnish guy or whatever it, 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 i can't it, it, jo joseph finest or whatever um because michael jackson was at that time the light-skinned version of him so they were using a white actor to do it and then there was all this outrage that they were picking a white actor to play michael jackson and so that changed but that demand didn't happen at all with david Carradine, right no, no one even raised that question back when Bruce Lee was there. So I'm wondering whether or not we're going to start seeing more. I, I, I mean, I think it shouldn't be happening now, but that it's going to actually change at a faster rate mm -hmm. than in the past. And the world that we live in is much more uh, diverse and people in the variety of, of these positions, like even in these advertising ones that you're talking about, these industry ones. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry, but go ahead. Like, what do you, I mean, so I actually, my first episode, I had my acting coach on Martin Blank and we talked about diversity in Hollywood and when is that going to change if ever? 
Um, and we talked about, uh, like, what does it take? Like, Sidney Portier, do you know who he is? Uh huh. Yeah. Um, he was the, for my recollection, the first big black movie star. And I was very curious, like, at that time, how is there a black movie star? And uh, Martin was alluding to the fact that the audience has to want to go on a journey with you. So yeah. for uh, me being South Asian, there has to be a South Asian, like there's no South Asian movie stars in Hollywood. There has to be first one that breaks the ground that the audience is attracted to. After Tom Cruise starred in Risky Business, the audience loved him. They were willing to follow him on the journey in Top Gun. So to have a big change, I think you need that first pioneer. And yeah. after you have that pioneer, um, it will open the door for other people of that same ethnicity, in my opinion. Now, a lot of these decisions are made by executives at these uh, companies. Um, but now you have other executives such as Netflix coming into the game, right. um, Amazon. Um, so things are changing, but they're s changing slowly because a lot of the old executives would have rather put a white person in an ethnic role because they thought it would sell more and that was a proven model. And yeah. when you're in that industry, you're putting a lot of money in to trying yeah. to catch lightning in a bottle. So yeah. you're trying to mitigate as much risk as possible. And instead of taking a big risk and actually properly casting diversity as it should be, it's a safer bet to put in someone that is established that is of white descent or a Caucasian descent because that is a proven model. And I think as executives change and there's more diversity in the business of the yeah. entertainment business, then you will start seeing, oh, there's uh, instead of 10 white people in a room, there's uh, three, 10 white males in a room, there's three females, there's a few black people, there's a few Asian people. And then decisions will change from the top because then those executives can say, well, I could see myself playing that story as an ethnic, as an ethnic person. So I think it starts from the top level. And as more uh, people come to America, they become um, embedded in the Hollywood system and they become educated and they get to positions of power. I think it will trickle down from there and change in the industry. Yeah, and sure. it is slowly happening. And I think if I ever wanted to be an actor 20 years ago, no, no shot at all. And I think right now it's still hard for me being South Asian sure. because there's not that much. But I think if anything, it's the best time right now. But as decades change and as you see pioneering movies like Black Panther, where you have an ensemble black cast and it goes and makes like, what, a billion dollars or close to a billion dollars yeah. in the box office, that changes uh, studios norms of how to approach it or crazy rich, rich Asians. And then in terms of having women, like you're seeing women action movie stars, like Charlize Theron, like right. she is the first action movie star woman that I think I've ever seen. Uh, I maybe, um, kill Bill. I forget, uh, Uma yeah, yeah. Thurman, maybe yeah. her, but she didn't do a diverse role. Charlize Theron is doing a diverse role of being a kick-ass woman movie star. Uh, so I think in time it's going to change. I think it's going to change from the top and then trickle down there. But with time, uh, I don't think it'll ever be a perfect system, but I think it'll definitely get better. Um, yeah. So I think that's, it's, uh, I mean, I think that there's a level of, of uh, correct impatience with the world that represents us reflecting who we are uh, at some level and that uh, people that are, uh, you know, older uh, are still trying to capture the world that was when they were younger, as opposed yeah. to the world as it is today. And so I think this is all part of the, the, the evolution of societies and how they change. And, um, but I, I, I think that, that it's interesting. So my, one of my former students, Ben Powell, wrote a book about uh, basic, it's called Out of Poverty. And it's a book about uh, industrial transformations. And his argument is that from to, for the factory system to evolve into modern labor markets. In England, it took 100 years. 
uh, you know, in the United States, it takes like 80 years. Uh, when you get to the East Asian tigers or whatever, it takes like 25, 30 years. And that now, like you're starting to see countries be able to make that transition in 10 years or whatever. And I wonder whether or not we don't, you know, one of the reasons that we might have to ask a question is, why haven't we seen that similar kind of transformation in Hollywood that we saw, let's say, in some of the major league sports. Like, so you think about baseball and integrating of baseball, and pretty soon after that, baseball didn't just integrate African Americans, but basically was taking talent from the Dominican Republic, you know, Puerto Rico, wherever they could find, you know, very talented baseball players. And, uh, and, and, and you see a kind of a quick transformation of that discipline. Um, but it took a long time before management went yeah. in that direction, right? And now you see more uh, diverse management and, and, and all this. So anyway, I kind of find it, um, you know, an interesting story to think about related to what you were just talking about, because it's about the evolution of an industry and the more contestation that would happen, the quicker maybe those things could happen because you'd have yeah. quicker demonstration effects. So maybe the fact that now you could have a show, a movie on YouTube, you know, yeah. right now demonstrate to people that, you know, like your friend that, that you're in the movie that did the fine arts movie or whatever, they, they could produce that independently Yep. now in a way that 25 years ago they never could have produced maybe. yeah and they can put it out on youtube and they have a platform for distribution and that is a very big thing that wasn't there 10 20 years ago yeah is this platform for distribution like i wouldn't have been able to make this podcast probably like 10 years ago and as easily distributed as i can today so yeah, it's, it's all about timing um and <laughs> with hollywood it I really don't understand because at the end of the day, everything's driven by money, but there's such a big Asian market out there that I just don't understand. Like movies are not just domestic, they're international. Yeah. And something I actually found alarming was in India, about 500 billion people don't have access, not billion, million people don't have access to the internet. In today's yeah. age, that's the size of America, don't have access to the internet. So once those people get online, if you're producing content for those yeah, people that look explode. like them, you're going to make so much more money. Yeah. So I think there's missed opportunities that they're not seeing right now. They're not, I think a lot of people are short-term thinking. They're not long-term thinking. But if you look in the long run, there is huge domestic growth internationally for the internet, for entertainment. Yeah, like you, right should, now, you should have Shruti. Yeah. Who? What'd you sorry? What'd you say? Uh, so there's a uh, so with Alex Tabarak and Tyler Cowen, they're trying to have economic education throughout India, and there's a, a woman that's involved in it. She's very good. She'd be very entertaining. Her mom was is is a very famous sitar performer in back in India. Uh, Shruti Rajagopalan, and uh, I uh, so. Um, Anyway, I, I think you should have her and talk to her on the show about what's going on in India and everything, because I think it's just some amazing. There's this tech wizard that's over there that's trying to, his program hasn't gone anywhere yet, but he's try, he calls it uh, FAB, Free a Billion Now. Uh, it, and it's about trying to get internet access and educational access to all these people throughout all mm -hmm. of India, which don't have it at the moment. And, you know, it's just an amazing opportunity. And so we think if we've seen the era of globalization in the last 20 years, right? So 2015 is the first time in human history that less than 10% of the world's population was living under $2 a day. If you go back to 1980, that percentage is over 30% of the world's population. So this is amazing delivery from poverty of billions of people. But just like you said, still don't have access. Mm -hmm. Imagine what happens when that's freed up and all of a sudden this happens. It transforms the entire global world of access of information. Plus, just think about all the geniuses. You know, the, the, the great benefit, the reason why I hesitate on the capitalism question is because the great benefits of the development of the private property market economy 
which is what got called capitalism, though that might be a wrong name to call it. But the great benefit historically of that was that it demonstrated the power of ordinary people to do extraordinary things. The previous period, extraordinary things were the exclusive domain of the extraordinary people. Yeah. So only kings and queens could do things because the ordinary people were trapped in, they were repressed from being able to express and, and, and come up with anything new. They were crushed, right? Whereas when you free them up, all of a sudden, very ordinary people are the people that invent the things that no one else thought of beforehand. Exactly. And so it's about a system of allowing ordinary people to do extraordinary things, yeah. not privileging only the extraordinary. Yeah. And that's what we need to unleash. And when we think about unleashing the rural parts of China or unleashing the, 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 the remote areas in India, you're talking about unleash, let alone the whole continent of Africa, which has not, we're talking about unleashing extraordinary like ideas potential, right? Because among those ordinary people, how many of them are like, you know, do you ever, uh, like the next guy who invented infinity? Did, exactly, the next it, Einstein. Yeah, the next Einstein that just hasn't been tapped into yet because they don't have internet access and they're yeah. in some remote village and, and, and whatnot. And so to me, I think the future, if we allow it to be free and open, is going to be brilliant. But if we repress it because of fear and resentment, we're going to end up by, you know, putting us back in time rather than forward. Yeah. And I think this is true for arts, for commerce, for science, everything. So, And, I, and with the, the onset of um, artificial intelligence, I know that's a big buzzword, but with that coming alive, it's going to make society so much more efficient. Obviously, it's a scary thought because um, there's a lot of bad that comes with that kind of technology. Think of Skynet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> example, but um, there's I'll so much <laughs> good that you could bring to the world. And uh, I just read about a company yesterday in India, and I asked my mom, I'm Indian, and uh, I was like, What is this company Reliance? Because I'm hearing Google and Amazon's all buying into this company Reliance, and Reliance is basically think of Amazon on steroids in India. So they have a major market. They own major market in um, retail and in technology. And in the last four years, they launched a service called Geo. And Geo has now become the number one platform for um, connectivity. So they're trying to connect all of India and the 500 million people that aren't online yet. And I don't fully know, so I'm just speculating at this point, but from what I've heard, the Indian government is somewhat corrupt, not as corrupt as, as you might think of, Asia, of China or Russia, but they're able, this Reliance company is able to have a major market share. So they're able to provide the best cost, what uh, my family in India says, for access to the internet, access to television. Yeah. But that's a little scary thought because what if there was competition and someone could offer at a lower price? Yeah. So I never want to lose. I want people to understand that competition is necessary. Not big companies are bad. Don't look at them as bad. Uh, as long as they're not so big that other players can't um, be inspired to become an entrepreneur and rival them, yeah, yeah. make better products for the people. Yeah. Um, that's, a, I, that's what I mean by con con contested or contestability. There's someone always there. To, that keeps them, you know, keeps their feet grounded because they got to keep running. Yep. So there's a great line in the movie um, uh, Moneyball where, uh, uh, you know, the Brad Pitt character turns to the scout and he basically, the scout's bitching about like the new, you know, system. And he goes, adapt or die. You know, like <laughs> and, and I think that that is the real like mentality that one has to have about, the nature of market contestation. It's about adapting and adjusting. It's one of the reasons why I think Austrian economics 
is such an important framework for studying because it puts the focus on the market process, on the entrepreneurs that are agent of change and all of that, whereas standard economics tends to focus on those equilibrium end states and not explain the adapting and adjusting that goes on to bring about those end states. But, you know, that's a, that's a very parochial you know, inner economics battle or whatever. But the basic, I think, key issue on all of this, for example, in India, is can you have a society of openness? And one of the problems with Modi is that he came in originally promising in some sense to do that, and then he re resurrected old religious wars, right? And it's like, what the hell, dude? Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> like, I thought you were supposed to bring in modernity. Instead, you're trying to drag us back. And I think this is one of the problems in the United States with Trump, right? I mean, you know, Trump comes in and he says he's going to drain the swamp. And then the next thing you know, he's like doing all kinds of things to like protect American firms against competition from far firms from afar. He's trying to cut down the number of immigrants that are coming in, which instead what we want to have is as much immigration as possible. Uh, and by the way, think about my even my fiscal gap story reverses. If all of a sudden we have a whole hell of a lot of people coming in here that are productive, we start living lifting up productivity with more people, we end up by closing the gap. Whereas yeah. if we have a smaller demographic and the gap gets bigger, then we got to pay a bigger tax burden. So, you know, I just, I can't stand, you know, in the middle of the, of the financial, uh, I mean, of the, the financial wake of, of the COVID stuff, you know, Trump tries to get through this thing that would question the F1 visas of foreign students. It's like, dude, like this is the worst thing you possibly could do. Thankfully, they backed off some of that, but it still affects incoming students a lot more than ones who are already here. But it's, it's really unproductive policies that are being produced for reasons that don't make a lot of sense. Yeah, there's a lot that goes on in the government that I, I, I as a young person, I just don't understand. And I, I just try to always go back to what are the motives? Like, what is driving them to make these decisions? You know, and I, it's illogical to an extent. And I don't know how to change it besides be idealistic and half glass half full and say, OK, well, I'm going to throw my hat into the race and I'm going <laughs> to figure it out. Yeah. But then you always hear those stories and then nothing ever comes from them. So I, I, I always, this is why I always turn to technology. And I think that's the best factor to help the world move forward um, because they're producing a good or service. They're not yeah. just talking, they're actually doing something. So besides and, Elon Musk, do you know Ray Kurzweil? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, obviously if we have the singularity moment <laughs> and, you know, all these things go away, right? Because basically, you know, we have this infinite production, you know, growth. Uh, but, you know, when we are talking about like why things go wrong. So it's very interesting because we do live in a world where there are people who are bad actors. But I think bad actor theory of why things go wrong is not really a theory. It just says bad people do bad things, good people do good things. What we really need to do is look and see what are the systematic incentives that are at work that distort even good people from doing good things and they end up by doing bad things or limit bad people so much that even though they're bad, they end up by doing things that are good. And that's all in these institutions that we want to look at. So when I look at the government dysfunctions at the moment, having to do with race, gender, sexual orientation, uh, uh, ethnicities or whatever, uh, odious nationalism. I always look at it not so much in the first cut, not so much as blaming it on preferences of people, or at least I don't want to do that because I don't want to say racist people do racist things or sexist people do sexist things. I want to look at what institutions actually empower people with those preferences to act on them or what institutions would raise the cost of 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 uh of of acting on that and so therefore they do less of it even if that doesn't change their heart it changes their behavior and all i care about for social interaction is their behavior because i don't have a judgment on their heart this goes back to very in my view it goes back all the way to your first beginning statements when you were saying about learning 
uh, martial arts because mm -hmm. part of the martial arts thing is to you just raise the cost of the bully. So yeah. the bully, so the bully still might have his same insecurities and his same thing, but he's not going to mess with you because he knows if he messes with you, he gets his ass kicked. And so therefore he don't want to get his ass kicked. So he just stays away. So he might stay away and he might say things under his breath and everything, but you don't care because he's not bugging you. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that's, what are the institutions that breed that? Because we want a society that's less racist, that's less xenophobic, that's less sexist, that's less, you know, uh, uh, homophobic, right? And you want all those things. And so the question is, how do I get less of that? And that's a function of the institutions rather, and in the long run, I agree with everyone. In the long run, the more experience people have with others, the more comfortable they become with others, the less their attitude. So I want maximum experience with that. But I think in the short run, what we have to settle for is institutions that, that raise the cost of engaging in that bad behavior. And therefore that will reduce the amount of behavior and maximize the opportunities for interaction. So I don't know, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a, we, we face some really difficult challenges going back to your question about the future of capitalism in the United States, because um, the excesses that have been allowed to grow since 2010 have not sit, sat well with people at all. And so to me, Trump is a symptom, not a cause. And so there's something wrong going on if that's like, if that's your symptom, right? So there's some real sickness in society if that's the thing that sort of emerges. But I think that that's even true. And if you look at like the choice that we're confronted in 2016 and the choice we're confronted in 2020, because it's not like the choice in 2016 was an inspiring choice. And it's not like the choice in 2020 is an inspiring choice. It's, yeah. it, it, we don't really have people that capture the imagination of somebody. It's not like someone, you know, Bernie's old uh, director of a campaign referring to voting for Biden the other day had some choice words, right, about, you know, it's basically you're choosing between two bads, not choosing something that you really find romantic and exciting about it. Yeah. And 2008, 2012, people did have a choice that they thought was one that they could wrap their heads around and get real excited about, but they haven't since. And that seems something weird, right? That like mm -hmm. politics hasn't generated that out of the process. And that's in the US. You know, imagine if you're in these other places. Yeah, I don't know politics enough to be sure about what I'm about to say, but with the Democratic Party, it looked like there were other nominees that were more charismatic and inspiring, but the party wouldn't let them. Yeah. Win. And yeah. that starts from inner corruption. And the only way I see it ever changing is the parties are so spread apart and so corrupted that I think you need to have a rise of the independent party of someone with the best of both worlds, you know, who, I don't know how you get funding because at the end of the day, money is the thing that's the driving factor. But if there's some way to get funding for an independent party that isn't super radical on each side and can take <laughs> a middle ground and inspire people and be yeah. positive, uh, have positive intentions, that can really do good for the world. Because I agree with you on that sentiment that it's choosing between two evils. And from everyone I talk to, it's weird. the exact yeah. same way. Yeah, and that means that en the energy is all blown out of the system, so there's no real change in the midst of all of this. It's kind of a funky thing that we're going on. Um, you know, third parties in the United States uh, history, sometimes they've played an important role in modern times. They haven't been allowed to precisely because of the, the party politics that you talked about earlier. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's, you know, we're, we're <laughs> you know, we've even, so like, I don't, cur I ha you know, we've been talking for a while, so I don't know what happened today. Uh, I do know that they had a meeting earlier today, but yesterday I was driving uh, and I was listening to NPR 
And at noon, the Republicans called off the weekend of negotiating and went home. <laughs> and it's not like they stayed there. They like went home. And the, the unemployment insurance was running out at the end of the day, right? And so I was just thinking to myself, what's the politics going on here? Because they're not even showing the normal theater. The normal theater would have been that they would have stayed till midnight last night debating with each other, you know, about their principled objections to one another. And then they would have come up with some kind of, you know, last minute little program. They took their ball and went home and said, no, nope, we're not coming back till Monday on noon on a Friday. And it's like, they're not even willing to pretend yeah, anymore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Put on the show anymore. That tells you something about how far apart the world is. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is <clears throat> really, you know, your two worlds of your, your academic interests and your acting interests, they line up in a weird way. And uh, there's a great book by Irving Goffman. It's called The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. And his argument is, is that we're all acting you know, at different times, you know, that, that we, because what we care about in our social interactions is what we project to other people. Yeah. So we, we want to be, be somebody other than who we might currently be about who we project to others. One of the questions about that, of course, is always like, oh, well, do, is this person really who they say they are? And we need to figure that out. That's why trust is important and everything like that. But what happens when we live in a society where we strip the veneer and we just say, I don't care how I look to you, right? I'm just going to go the other way. So I think there's two issues that have to be balanced. One is self-censorship because you're going to be so critical of me that whatever I reflect to you, you're going to hate. Or the other one is, I don't give a crap. Here I am. And, and like, so I'm old compared to you. So I love the TV show Seinfeld. Oh, I love and, that. And, and, and there's a great episode in there where Kramer just blurts out, like the character Kramer is interesting because he, he has no social filter, right? <laughs> and so George is dating this, this woman who has a really big nose. And George, <laughs> she's beautiful, except she has a really big nose. And George is real sensitive about, you know, he's trying to give her hints about that she should get a nose job. <laughs> but he doesn't want to he doesn't want to tell her directly because he's afraid of it and then Kramer comes into the room and says you know he's sitting there and and, and they're saying oh you know you're so beautiful blah 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 you should do this and he goes yeah you would be really beautiful but you gotta you know your nose is just way too big like that and he just says it <laughs> and and like you're in shock that he says it because he, he does it but so there's certain aspects of social interaction in which self-censorship is really like in order for civility to go forward yeah. and then other ones where it's stifling and we find this fine balance but right now it seems like the divide in our political life is one where the one side doesn't care at all what they present to the other side yeah. and they just strip it and they're like here you know i'm going to be a you know you're the worst person in the world you're the worst person in the world and in that world can you ever cooperate with one another to get anything done? It's very weird. Yeah, you bring up a very interesting communication uh, thing that I think about, and I don't know if this is a problem, but it's that fine line of uh, presentation, but being authentic. Yeah. And it's really hard because uh, if you sound too calculated, people are gonna think negative of you. They're gonna be like, oh, this guy's notorious or, why does he sound like that? And I noticed that with a lot of engineers is they stutter a lot, they overthink things, and it comes off cold um, because they have no show. But then there's very charismatic people where they're, they're saying the right things, but well, the way they're saying it is so entertaining and enthusiastic. Um, for example, uh, there's this motivational speaker, um, I'm forgetting his name, but he always talks about sleeping as little as possible, giving up sleep to go and do everything. And for years I tried that and I was like, okay, this is not a good strategy because your body needs sleep. Yeah, yeah. Like sleeping yeah. on two hours a night does not work. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. He, he sounds so inspiring and he motivates me to sleep little and just work, work, work. But like now I'm decreasing how productive I am for those amount of hours of being awake. Yeah, yeah. But he was so good at, at selling that motivation but at the same time the essence wasn't there so it's this fine line if you're going to be a great communicator between yeah. saying something really important 
but at the same time being authentic in the way you say it and entertaining. So it's a very weird balance and an interesting communication problem that I think it's by trial and error you have to develop. And uh, by no means am I a great communicator, but I think this podcast has helped me, you know, talk with different people and improve different um, unorthodox skills. And I think Bill Gates was talking about that. One of the suggestions he recommended to people was to do something outside of their comfort zone because they would become more confident in that area and that would bleed over to what they're actually doing. Yeah. So you really have to, uh, I think, and I agree with that sentiment a lot, put yourself in uncomfortable, uncomfortable positions, learning something new, and that will help you grow. Maybe taking a singing class, that has nothing to do with being an economics professor, but that's going to give you some mm -hmm. charisma. It's going to change the way you walk, the way you hold yourself, the way yeah. you talk with your diaphragm. So yeah, yeah, I think no, it's, it's, it goes back to what you were talking uh, about, you know, before, right in the beginning, actually. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, it's amazing how we can tap into our curiosity, how we can improve those skills by putting ourselves in uncomfortable situations, testing ourselves against those. That's the contestation there. And, and uh, so, you know, uh, I know we're running on, so maybe this will, I'll wrap it up. But, but <laughs> you know, one of the things that I think is, is in my experience, I've been very fortunate with is that I got to know Vernon Smith, uh, who's a Nobel Prize winner. And I got to know Eleanor Ostrom, who's also a Nobel Prize winner. And one of the things that's really fascinating about them is how they're lifelong learners. They always were looking for places to learn from that wasn't based on what their comfort zone was. And so you could go to lunch with them or sit down just to have a conversation with them. And they're likely to talk to you about things in anthropology or psychology or even biology as much as they were in their own respective areas where they were you know, from. And they were constantly throwing themselves in those kind of situations. Eleanor Ostrom, which I'll leave with this actually, Eleanor Ostrom was an institutional political scientist. That's what she was. She, she did field studies. And in her 60s, I think, it's, I think she's around 60, maybe in her 50s, she went to, to Germany with her husband. They were there on a research trip. And she retooled herself to learn game theory and experimental. Mm -hmm. And so then what she did was she like combined her field work with game theory ideas, with, uh, you, know, uh, you know, experimental ideas. And so one of my, you know, favorite essays of hers is, is um, an essay in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, in which she's trying to study uh, forestry and resource use. And what she did was she studied it using satellite imagery and then she studied it on the ground with doing an ethnography of the people in the area. And then she came up with a game and did a field lab experiment with the people. And her argument was, is to try to triangulate the various different from the air, on the ground, in the lab, you know, kind of idea. And then from that composite, you learn something about the world, what she called multiple methods methodology. She came up with that mid-career. Not, you know, and, and just think about the energy and creativity and the riskiness, because she was already famous, but now she's willing to be famous more, right? Yeah. And so I think that Vernon Smith's the same way, I mean, in terms of constantly learning and evolving and, you know, the guy's, you know, 90 years old and he's still as fresh as a daisy, you know, in terms of, you know, his mind, when you talk to him, he's fertile as can be. And it's a real great example. And I think that mind or that quality of mind should be what we want to reflect as intellectuals to young people that l learning is not something you do between 18 and 21, then you stop learning. That's just the very beginning of your journey. What you want to do is be learning when you're 70 and, nine, and you know, 80 and 90 because you're still learning through that whole time. Yeah. And I think if we, if we encourage that and the kind of institutions that are conducive to that, then the, all these society questions, some sense, take care of themselves. Yeah. Because we're building up from the bottom up 
the kind of society which is able to absorb all this, this stuff. Yeah. And the way to do that, the way to keep learning is to follow what you're curious about. That's how you do it. That's how you stay young at any age. I was listening to a neurologist talk about brain functionality and why when you get older, it's so much harder to learn things. Well, you're set in your ways to oversimplify what, they're gonna, what they said is you just don't want to learn. Like you've learned what you've learned. You're doing your job at the level that you're okay with. You have a life, but you have to put yourself in those uncomfortable positions and constantly learn. And it's hard to learn things that you're not interested in. But as you get older, whatever you're motivated by, whatever you find curious, investigate it more. And you have the internet and that makes a world of difference. If I had to go read a book for everything I wanted to learn, I probably wouldn't learn as much. But at the fingertips, you can Google anything you want. You can go to YouTube to see a visual representation of that, which sticks yeah. more vividly in people's brains, especially mine. So utilize the tools you have. I would like to thank you for being on the podcast. I know oh, yeah, no, it's great for a long time, but you've been great. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great. And I, I think this is wonderful that you're doing this. And good luck in all your different ventures. Thank it's you really so phenomenal. <laughs>